Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, the atheists, the agnostics, the Hindus, the Buddhists, everyone all around the world who's watching right now. Thank you for joining us. This is the first time I've been live with Islam Critiques, a.k.a. Colin. How you doing, Colin? I'm doing great, David. And uh, as soon as I turn uh, the YouTube video down, I need to mute that. Yeah, I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, just let me check uh, everyone hear us clearly. Just uh, make sure it's uh, good to handle these things at the beginning. Um, all right, so we wanted to get together for a little while now for um, for a live stream. And tons of people, tons of people have asked me uh, to get you on for a live stream. A lot of them are girls. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's those uh, it's those I think it's those piercing blue eyes that they want to see uh, on mm. on the live stream <laughs> hopefully it's something uh, a bit more in depth than that but, uh, yeah hopefully it's the content now uh, I, I think we have to uh, oh, what do we have here uh, Mystic says uh, David with no facial hair is so strange yeah I know uh, I feel naked um, without uh without uh, any facial hair um just so you guys know that was for uh a jeffrey epstein video um, jeffrey epstein didn't have facial hair so i had to cut off all my facial hair to play jeffrey epstein and muhammad meets jeffrey epstein and uh whenever i get around to editing that that will be up all right uh, i can't think of what epstein and muhammad had in common so i can't wait no, to see that there's, there's we really couldn't figure out where to go with that one i mean it's it's uh i mean you know there, there's no no parallels whatsoever there um vocab actually vocab actually wrote that script uh, which is cool because we have we have slightly different senses of humor so um mm -hmm. people who watch th watch them can notice there are kind of uh there are differences in the way uh in the way we script out um our episode but uh colin of, of of all the different things you could do in the world that just so everyone knows we have we have uh we have some topics that we're going to get to um, but it's just good in case anyone uh, isn't familiar with Colin uh, and the work he does. Uh, have a little introduction here at the beginning. But uh, Colin, of, of all the things you could be doing in the world, why are you making videos about Islam and the origins of Islam and things like that? Sure. Well, there are a lot of different reasons. Um, originally, I saw your debates a long time ago, along with several others. Perhaps that was what sparked my interest because I kept hearing Islamic apologists saying different things, disagreeing on some pretty key issues. And uh, I thought, you know, there's a way I can get to the bottom of this and I'll just read the text for myself. And so that's what I started doing um, over time, just developed uh, a love for Muslims and a desire to reach them. And more recently, uh, just really developing some interest in those early formative uh, years of Islam and the types of things that recent scholarship is shedding light on now that uh, scholars are no longer willing to take the traditional Islamic narrative at face values. There's some really important things coming to light. It's a great time to be in Islamic studies and uh, a great time to be spreading the good news to Muslims. So. Yeah, that that is. Uh, these are really, really awesome times. And uh, I, I point this out a lot. Guys, it's, it's very easy to look around the world and you got persecution in Muslim lands, and you've got all sorts of horrible things going on in the world. And it's easy to look at that, the terrorist attacks, the you know groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda, and so on. It's easy to look at all that and get discouraged. But man, if you if you really want to refute Islam, uh, whatever background you're from, whether you're Christian or atheist, or whatever, if you wanna if you want to undermine and refute Islam, uh, or if you want to reach Muslims with the gospel, there is no better time in all of history to be in, my friends. Uh, these are these are really really cool times. Now, absolutely, and the the internet. That's that's the cool thing about this whole mm -hmm. internet thing. Is have you read the uh, the video on dreams and visions? Is Jesus awakening a Muslim world? I don't know if you've read that or not. Definitely recommend it to the viewers as well. Um, just a really good book mm -hmm. about the way that Jesus is appearing to Muslims in dreams and visions. And he has stories from all over the place, from Jordan to, you know, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq. And it's interesting. And it really just gives you a kind of a kickstart, you know, if you're getting tired of this whole YouTube thing, because so many cases, these Muslims, all they have is the internet or TV or radio. So there's this woman who um, she asked this missionary, can I worship 
Jesus in the bathroom. You know, and the guy's like, what are you talking about? She was um, still married, but she was an apostate from Islam. And her husband was still a Muslim, and she's in deep trouble if she's found mm. out. So what she did was she took a radio, and she hid it in her bathroom. And when she thought the time was safe, she would go in there, and she would listen to Bible reading or sermons or something like that. But so many times these stories will have not only um, the radio or the TV, but the Internet. Mm. And honestly, some with some of these people, the Internet is the only way they get sort of a, a glimpse of the outside world and the only way that we can – you know, inject new material into their plausibility structures and start to change the way they think about their religion. So mm -hmm. it's it's a great time, and it's also a really important thing to do. You know, the Great Commission is it's online now as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, that's uh, that's one of my goals for uh, not not right at the moment, but but sometime uh, later this year, and especially next year, will probably be one of my main, uh, probably be my uh, possibly my main focus is. Uh, making sure that there's an online place um, that that you know all the apologists trust that we can direct Muslims to who in their own lands aren't just aren't safe going out to church. How can they have uh, you know online fellowship, basically online church? Uh, in their homes where they don't have to go out and actually be in danger um, where they're from because it, it's just um, it, it's kind of an ongoing problem over the years that you know I see all these people regularly saying you know hey David you know I just left Islam I just became a Christian and so on and I'm looking at it and this guy's in like Saudi Arabia or something like yeah. that or 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 Iran or something I'm thinking gosh what do I what do I tell this person so it's kind of a, a little situation where um, you know, a lot of these people are converting, but I don't, you know, I, I don't know who's, you know, discipling them or who they're going to end right. up with and stuff like that. So it has to be kind of more organized, right? Like more organized, like here's all the material refuting mm -hmm. Islam. Here's all the material showing that Jesus uh, is Lord. Now that you've converted here, make sure you're grounded in the basics of theology. Make sure you're grounded in the basics of apologetics. And if you're in a place where it's not safe to actually go out to other, you know, be part of a fellowship and to be discipled, uh, we'll make sure that you have everything you need uh, online. And so, yeah, yep, that's, that's, that's it's really important. And it's, it seems so abstract, you know, you, you and I know, and, and everyone else who does this, you sit here and you look at a camera and you talk and blah, blah, blah. You know, there are, there's a, an ex-Muslim woman in a bathroom, you know, listening to mm -hmm. these videos. Yep. There's a man somewhere who's hiding in a closet or his bedroom um, listening to, to these videos. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not as abstract as it feels. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm looking. Uh, I'm looking. What's cool here is uh, there are lots of other people who want to get involved. So we had uh, uh, Reason Answers Apologetics videos um, said... Mm -hmm. Uh, Act 17 Apologetics got me interested in Islam, and Islam Critique convinced me to start a YouTube channel. I'm so excited to see you together. And there are other comments like that. Uh, I'm not going to get to uh, all of them, uh, but but here's another one. David, I'm 20, and you inspired me to start an Apologetics YouTube channel. I start recording next week. Uh, that's awesome because, gosh, 10 years ago, I was telling I was telling Christians, I was telling big Christian ministries, guys... Do not miss this opportunity that these uh, that these platforms are providing to get truth around the world. And it was, uh, come on, that's just a, you know passing phase, David. And now, fortunately, everyone's everyone wants to jump in there. So cool times, cool times. Uh, shout out to Absolutely. shout out to Oliver Kennedy in the uh, super chat. He said, "God bless, keep up the great work," and uh, Stevie AF as well. Um, all right. So, oh wait, there, there is there is one more. There is one more issue that we have to. There was one more. Um, Big problem, elephant in the room. Uh, why should we listen to anything you say, Colin, when I've heard, I've heard from very reliable sources that uh, you deep down you know that Islam is true, uh, but you're being paid so much by Jews that you're refuting Islam for the money that you're getting in this world, even though you mm -hmm. even though it's true. Why should anyone listen to you, given given that that's a fact? Well, you should listen to me because the Jews are wise investors. I mean, they're not going to make a bad investment. So take the Jews' word for it. Listen to Islam critique. Listen to David Wood. Ignore all of the money that we're just stuffing in our closets and under our mattresses. You know, <laughs> that's that's why you should listen. I'm actually yeah. sitting on a big 
big mm. bag of money that that Jews gave. And guys, if you if you <laughs> if you don't know what we're talking about, anytime anyone criticizes Islam, uh, the response you get from lots of Muslims is you're doing it, you're doing it to get paid. Guys, I have a PhD in philosophy. I could be living a nice, comfortable life as a philosophy professor. I would love doing that every day. I'm doing this because someone has to do this. As much as it sucks to be threatened with death regularly, to be threatened with having your wife raped and everyone killed and your kids killed, as much as that sucks, someone has to do this. Uh, but no notice the, the mentality. You guys can't actually have a problem with us uh, modeling our lives after a guy who had sex with a nine-year-old girl and did all these other horrible things and called for the violent subjugation of the entire world. You can't possibly have a legitimate problem with that. It must just be for money. So, uh, yeah, so there you go. I wish I would have started a stopwatch. I think it was about two weeks from the first video I posted. Maybe it's two months. From the first video I posted until the first time I got that comment, you're getting paid by the Jews. And then I realized that the person was serious and so there's sort of stage one, which is, I can't believe this person honestly believes that. And then there's the second stage of, these are the types of people I'm trying to reach. How on earth do I do that? <laughs> so it's a problem. It really mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So guys, uh, on these, on the, when, when I talk on these live streams, I normally keep it like, uh, I normally do like bread and butter stuff like, you know, uh, jihad or... Uh, Muhammad in the Bible, the, the 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 standard topics. But it's cool to have other people on here who want to um, go into more depth on topics that I would I would not otherwise be covering. And that's what we're going to do uh, right now. Uh, I'm going to hand things. But I'm going to basically going to hand things over to Colin because he's going to be talking about some issues that I have not studied um, along the way. We will take along the way. We'll take uh, some comments and stuff. Uh, but basically, I'm going to hand it, uh, hand a lot of time over to Colin to break things down. Um, I'll try. I don't know why I'm just bad at paying attention to someone and following along with with uh, you know chat and stuff like that. There, there are people like Vocab who seem to have two brains functioning at once. They can be listening to everything and be reading comments simultaneously. Um, I will I will try and get better. Uh, but uh, if anything is not clear, if anything is not clear, then uh, let me know in the chat and I'll try to uh, I'll try to uh, uh, back things up and uh, go into a little more. Uh, let me take one quick comment right now. Um, scale to top marketing agency why do you believe in jesus if there's no archaeological uh evidence of him um well what would how much archaeo do you know what you know what archaeological evidence is right you're talking about you know ancient stone inscriptions and things like that um if you're talking about a historical person the main evidence you'll be looking for is historical writings about him right texts that were written about him if you're talking about a first century jewish carpenter who went around and had three years of ministry, what archaeological evidence are you looking for? Now, we, we do, just to be clear, we do have some very interesting things, inscriptions and so on. Uh, those aside, the main sort of evidence you'd be looking for for, uh, for a, a first century person would be writings around him. And we have a lot. We have a lot of writings around, uh, about Jesus. And so that's the sort of evidence we're looking for. So if you want to know why we believe in Jesus, be happy to uh, talk about that uh, sometime yeah, later. And, and, and the first step of that is when you look at the Gospels. The, the, the first step, you know, when you're looking at is, is a document credible, you're looking at verisimilitude. If we looked at the Gospels and they had no verisimilitude, they didn't look anything like the first century Greco-Roman world, then we would have a lot of problems accepting the Gospels. But the fact is that's not the case. Even Jewish archaeologists use the Gospels to help figure out where to dig and interpret what they find when they dig there. Mm -hmm. So uh, just even if you're looking at just, you know, step one, are the Gospels remotely credible as historical sources? Yes, they do contain verisimilitude and uh, that there are um, you know, plenty of uh, interfaces there with the archaeological evidence that um, archaeologists have been discovering, especially since the archaeology age has been flourish flourishing since the 19th century. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um once more, uh, shout out to Indelible Sin 317. Thank you, Mr. Wood. You, your story is an inspiration for me to come back uh, more fully to Christ. And uh, Michelle Marie, um, how is Manny doing? I have been praying for him. Uh, Manny's still doing pretty, pretty rough. Um, I'm going to try. It just sucks because I keep traveling, but as soon as I get this next little trip out of the way, I'm going to go there and see him and, uh, um, 
yeah, I'll, uh, I'll 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 record an update when I get when I get up there. And uh, Jan Kass said, uh, I recently came into contact with a new secret believer in Turkey, baptized in secret last Saturday. Came to faith due to Nabil and David. He can read his English Bible because his parents can read English. That is awesome, and uh, you know it's just cool. We hear about all these uh, Christians in the underground church and uh, being you know baptized and so on and uh, just gonna be just gonna be awesome when there's when there are so many of them when there are so many of them that uh, the government can no longer stop them so awesome awesome times all right so we are going to start with everyone's favorite topic eschatology and uh, I'm, I'm kind of tongue-in-cheek but I also know it's it's true for a lot of people they love hearing about eschatology which I, I almost I almost never talk about beyond you know hey we win or something like that or, or talking about some of the things Muhammad said about about the judgment but um, don't go into a lot of detail but for some people that is a that is a very very uh, important topic to them so why would you want to be talking about eschatology right now? Yeah, well, you're watching the live chat. I'm not. But when you said the word eschatology, did like 400 people just sign off or <laughs> are we still OK? The um, especially over the last couple centuries and uh, the recent decades, the renewed look into the earliest formative years of Islam has been revived. It's really interesting stuff. And so when you stop taking the traditional Muslim account at face value, you begin to ask what were the earliest proclamations of the messenger, later known as Muhammad? What was the earliest proclamation in the Quran? What were the earliest proclamations in the Hadith? If you wanted to go back to the very beginning, it's really interesting stuff. So we'll set all of the morality issues aside, immorality mm -hmm. issues aside, and we'll talk about theology and um, eschatology. What we're going to see is that there is a very healthy strand of imminent eschatology in the Quran, then we're going to see that people in the Quran respond to it, the messenger backs off a little bit, and then there's this kind of verse that comes out of nowhere that really looks like a later edition that goes against all of that other stuff. Okay, we're going to corroborate that imminent eschatology with the Hadith, with some traditions about Muhammad being resurrected and see how this all fits into the historical context. And we'll see that the only thing that's missing in Muhammad's eschatological picture was an antichrist, which actually wasn't missing at all. And we'll mm -hmm. go into uh, Merkava mysticism for that. So uh, Muslims who are watching, you know, we um, it's a little bit tedious, but if we only cite one verse or two or three, Muslims will say we're proof texting. And we don't want any of those accusations. So I'm going to go through several verses from the Quran that talk about imminent judgment. So if you will, just, you know, wipe your uh, your your canvas clean and think with me as we sort of paint a picture of Muhammad and what his earliest claims were. I think it makes sense if we see him as a very charismatic individual who believes that the end is near and it's going to occur within his lifetime and within the lifetimes of the hearers of the message of the Quran. So, imminent judgment, Surah 15.3. Leave them to eat and to take their joy and to be bemused by hope. Certainly they will soon know. 16.1. Allah's commandment has come, present tense. 16.77. The matter of the hour is but as the twinkling of an eye, or it is nearer. Surah 21.1. Their reckoning has drawn near to men. 26.6, therefore the news of that which they mock shall soon come to them. 40.18, the day of the impending, dot, 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 the impending is actually feminine. It doesn't agree with day. So Allah forgot to put something there, so let's fill in the blank. That's a we'll shocker. Allah out a little bit. <laughs> the uh, day of the impending hour, perhaps. That's what Allah meant to say. Sir, 40.70, they, that is the... The, uh, the those who criticize the messenger, they shall soon come to know. 5357 is my favorite. The near event, okay, the near event draws nigh. Literally, it's the impending is impending. Surah 52, 7 through 8, most surely the punishment of your Lord is about to fall. And 54, 1, the hour has drawn nigh. Are you picking up on this, David? Do you see how close judgment is? Sounds pretty close. Surah 3649, it will seize them while they are still disputing. 67, 27 through 29, but 
when they shall see it. Nigh the faces of those who disbelieve shall be sorry. And it shall be said, this is that which you used to call for. And then uh, blah, blah, blah. So you shall come to know who it is that is in clear error. 7840. Chastisement is near at hand. 75, 34 through 35. Not even Sam Shamoon could do all this. Kidding. Nearer to you is destruction and nearer again. Nearer to you and nearer. That's, that's, that's my favorite one. Now there are some objectors. Okay, we have some objections. 13.6, and they ask you to hasten on the evil. So these are people who are mocking the claims of the messenger. And they're saying, bring it on, bring it on. Surah 22.47. And they ask you to hasten on the punishment. 26.6, therefore the news of that which they mock shall soon come to them. 29.53, they shall ask you to hasten on the chastisement. And that's repeated in 37.176. And then Surah 76 through 7, they think it to be far off. We see it nigh. So clear picture, imminent eschatology, and then we have some who are mocking uh, the messenger. Then, as a response, we see some hesitation on the imminence of the judgment. So, 1751, maybe, this is the messenger speaking, maybe it has drawn nigh. Maybe. 2772, maybe there may have drawn near to you somewhat of that which you seek to hasten on. 3363, perhaps the hour is near. And that's repeated in 4217. And then we have this kind of oddball verse, 7225, say, I do not know whether that which you are threatened uh, to be nigh or whether my Lord will appoint it for a term. This actually, some scholars have said this really looks like a later addition to sort of cover the, this imminent eschatology, which was never actually realized. There are no so, later editions. What the heck? Come on, <laughs> man. Which part of which part of perfectly preserved right down to the yeah. letter didn't you understand when you read it in all those Muslim texts? Yeah, all right, go yeah ahead. it's interesting. I didn't read it in all those Muslim texts. That's part of the problem. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, one of the one of the later editions. So these are corroborated by the Hadith, and there have been scholars over the last century who have done a lot of work in the Hadith collections. And the problem becomes when you do all of this work looking for the historical core. You know, where is the historical core of this information? You end up with so little, especially in the Sira, that by the time you're done. Scholars are saying, is it really worth the time we're putting into this? But some work that has been sustained over the last century is looking at the Hadith collections and saying, okay, what are the earliest traditions? Which ones most plausibly go back to the messenger? And Shoemaker actually has a whole bunch of these um, all combined together for us. So I'll just read through some of these. This is from Stephen Shoemaker's book, The Death of a Prophet. And you know, he cites all of his sources, and I'll just read them all for you. So, he has been sent with the hour in order to avert you from a severe punishment. Okay, this is referring, of course, to Muhammad. Muhammad himself said, my coming and that of the hour are concomitant. Indeed, the latter almost arrived before me. Muhammad has been sent on the breath of the hour. The hour has come upon you. I've been sent with the hour like this. And this is the... Uh, Apostate prophet video is going through my head right now where he uh, he makes fun of the you know the two finger tradition but Muhammad joins his fingers together this is the Spock hadith you know he joins his fingers together and says that um, you know the, the the hour is is this close and uh, that's in Sahih Muslim as well um, Muhammad pointed to a young man and said if this young man lives the hour will arrive before he reaches old age. And again, if he lives long, he would not grow very old until the last hour would come. And then there's a tradition which describes the building of the first mosque in Medina. And Muhammad says, nay, build a booth like Moses. In other words, don't put all of that work into it because he says the affair will happen sooner than that. So if you build this structure, you know, uh, in, a, in a very sound way, if you put a lot of time into it, the hour is going to be here. So don't just just build it quick build it like they did back in the days of moses and that'll be good enough so we have uh oh wow how would i rest happily knowing that the man has taken the horn in his mouth and waiting for the order to blow the messenger of god described him to us and said that's referring to the antichrist the dajjal some of those who see me or hear my words will live to see him so pretty clear that um 
these hadith corroborate the Quran. Mm -hmm. Now there are several reasons. Could you uh, to could, think, could you repeat that last part of that last uh, that last hadith? Uh, sure. The are you referring to the one about the Dajjal, the Antichrist? Yes. Yeah, no. As far as the people who hear him. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, the messenger of God described him to us and said, some of those who see me or hear my words will live to see him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. So why should we think these are early? Well, there are a couple of reasons. And uh, one of them is that it's unlikely that later Muslims would come back and put these words on the lips of Muhammad. Mm -hmm or put them on the pen of Allah in the Quran. It's highly unlikely that Muslims would do that because these tradi traditions actually became very, well, problematic, mm -hmm. to put it honestly. And I can't even read Tabari's treatment on this but, but because it's so funny. But scholars have pointed out that this goes back to an early core of tradition that apparently Muhammad proclaimed and it goes back to that early important time and the evidence is that the Muslims didn't just jettison it when the hour didn't come. They didn't just toss it. Instead, they tweaked it little by little. And this, mm -hmm. like I said, I can't read Tabri's um, <laughs> account because it's even funnier than the Hadith about the rock taking Moses' clothes and running off with it. But Tabri, in volume one of his history, pages uh, 182 and 183, he gives his analysis, okay? So he says, obviously, you know, when you look at your, your index finger and your middle finger, and he measured them, and the index finger is 1 14th shorter than the middle finger, and if you do the math with numbers for the age of the earth, which I think he got from Jewish tradition, then clearly the time period that Muhammad was talking about was 500 years after uh, the time that he made the proclamation. So Tabari was dumb enough to say that, but he was smart enough to put that outside of his lifetime. Mm -hmm. So if you do the math, it's like 200 years after Tabari died, you know, after the term of his natural life. So smart. he makes this prediction, but it's far enough that nobody's going to falsify it in his lifetime. So pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all these, uh, all these guys, and you, you have different groups, you know, prophesying the end of the world and stuff. Um, you know. On the one hand, you have to think they're they're silly, but on the other hand, you have to respect them when they're like, "Nope, June nineteenth, one year from right now, is uh, that's when it's going to happen. That's that's when the return is, right? I mean, because they are they are they are putting themselves they are putting themselves out there, unlike Chabri. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But when you think about once again, we're we're painting the portrait of a prophet who is he's very charismatic. And he believes that the end of the world is coming. And part of this is the theological context of the Quran, because the question is asked um, when the Quran talks about, you know, messengers, there have been messengers sent to everyone. And where are all these messengers? And they end up being, I don't know, what, a couple hundred thousand of them. The reality is that the Quran is very centered on its place and its time. And there's this tradition of um, a cycle of destruction, actually, and it's one of those things like the story of Adam and Iblis or Iblis um, that you get tired of reading because it occurs so many times. But there's a cycle of destruction, the people of Ad and Thamud and Noah and Midian and blah, blah, blah. And if you read the Quran, and it, you actually, it's, it's tedious because of this cycle of destruction. But the short story is that the Quran pictures a group of people uh, successive groups of people who inhabit the same geographical region, which is where the Quran puts its hearers. Very clearly, the geography of the Quran is northern Arabia, just south of the Dead Sea there in that area. And so the Quran imagines that all of these people that it describes, the people of Ad and Thamud and so forth, they're all inhabiting the same geographical region, and they've all been successively destroyed by Allah. And this destruction is coming for them again. Okay, so that's sort of the theological context that I think contributed to the messenger believing that the end of the world was going to occur in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. But there are also some historical factors, right? You think about this, the geography of North Arabia, I mean, what's happening around the 7th century and what had been happening? You think about the warring mm -hmm. of the superpowers, right? The Byzantines and the Persians. What's one, especially if you're influenced by Jewish whatever interpretation, mysticism, and we're going to see all that in this live stream. If you're influenced by, you know, these Jewish traditions, war, 
War is a big one, right? Mm -hmm. And so the Byzantines and the Persians had been warring back and forth. What else do you need? You need some natural disasters. Dan Gibson has pointed out the prominence of earthquakes in this region of North America. So we have wars. We have earthquakes. What else do we have? We have plague, right? The plagues just rocked the urban areas, uh, you know, the, the, the crowded you know, city areas, especially of the Byzantine Empire. And when you read about the people who were killed in these plagues, the numbers are just staggering. And so – the sky is falling, you know, in Muhammad's mm -hmm. day. He's been influenced by the by this tradition that we see in the Quran regarding the cycle of destruction, and he thinks it's coming for him as well. Mm -hmm. Another eschatological element that you need, of course, is resurrection. And it's interesting that Muhammad seems to have had his resurrection or at least uh, <laughs> legends of it. One thing that we have to do when we see this massive gap in Islamic literature from the 7th century on to the time of the Sira and the Hadith is turn to other literature, other contemporary literature. We have something in uh, the mid 9th century. It's a Latin history of Muhammad, a life of Muhammad, and it corroborates something we see in the Hadith about Muhammad's resurrection. Once again, we're building this profile of a prophet who believes that the end is near and you have to have a resurrection. So. Um, this tale explains that when Muhammad sensed death, it had come upon him, and uh, there's a polemic in here that links this to his sin with Zayd's wife. He predicted that, that is Muhammad, predicted that he would be resurrected three days after his death by the angel Gabriel. Following his death, then, Muhammad's followers maintained a vigil, guarding his body and awaiting its resurrection. When three days later this did not transpire, Muhammad's body began to stink, and his followers convinced themselves that their presence was preventing the angel's appearance, so they left the body alone, and immediately, instead of angels, dogs followed the stench and devoured his flank. The, his, the, the dogs are probably what prevented the angel. <laughs> so I'm just saying. Sorry, that good. does have precedence, mm -hmm. yes, in Islamic literature. A little puppy dog, mm -hmm. a little puppy dog. Um, so this is also a, a similar story that's told in a Syriac version and uh, where Muhammad had proclaimed himself the paraclete, and so his followers expected him to arise after three days. Now, Muslims are listening to this going, that is nuts. That's utter nonsense. Sunan ibn Majah and Sahih al-Bukhari. All right, we'll start with Sunan ibn Majah. By Allah, this is Umar speaking, the messenger of Allah has not died. Umar couldn't accept his death. And he will never die until the hands and feet of – what is it about Umar and people's hands and feet being cut off? Then Abu Bakr stands up, and he recites a verse that no one had ever heard before, Surah 3, 144. Muhammad's going to die like everyone else. Bakari's version of this, Umar stood up and said, by Allah, Allah's messenger is not dead. Verily, Allah will resurrect him. So it seems that Muhammad convinced his followers or was convinced himself about his own resurrection, once again contributing to this prophet who believed that the eschaton was near, and perhaps so was his resurrection. Uh -huh. So – oh, I'm sorry. Did you have something? Oh, no. I was just – did that wrap up that – is that the content you wanted to put into that <clears throat> section? No. I mean think about the wars of apostasy, right? Uh -huh. So – we think about people leaving Islam because of, uh, you know, getting out of the the heavy yoke of Muhammad and the commanders of the believers who are later referred to as caliphs. Mm -hmm. How about people just didn't believe Muhammad's message? Yeah, I mean, he he says that the end is near within my lifetime and within your lifetime. He says this to his hearers, and that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then he dies. Oh, but he's going to be resurrected, and then that doesn't happen. Yeah. When you think about the massive waves of apostasy in early Islam, it seems to me that this was connected every bit as much with Muhammad's theology hmm. and his failed eschatology as it was with um, you know, getting out from under Muhammad's heavy yoke. Hmm. But what's, what's Islam today? If I go ask a Muslim, you know, what's, religion, what's your religion about? Well, what's it about? It's about Tawheed. It's about oneness. And why did Muhammad come? He came to... Uh, restore the Arabs, right, to monotheism. No, he didn't. That's a later development. The earliest proclamations in the Quran, the earliest uh, traditions in the Hadith that we see, 
go right back to Muhammad as this eschatological prophet who believes that the end is near. It's within his lifetime. It's going to happen, and it never does. Hmm. So, And so then we have yeah. the apostate wars when people have to be brought back in. All right. All right. Yeah. You all, uh, you all getting this here? So, so go go ahead and, uh, go ahead, go ahead and, uh, especially for people who are just tuning in now, just, uh, kind of sum up just, just what you said right there in case they missed anything. Okay. The, the, the quick summary would be that we have good reason to believe that the earliest traditions, whether it's Hadith or Quran that go back to Muhammad are, uh, proclamations of an imminent eschatology that's going to occur within the lifetime of Muhammad and the lifetime of its hearers. We even have associated with this, um, traditions about Muhammad's resurrection. Of course, none of this came to pass, but when we kind of take a step back and look at this, look at the theology of Muhammad, the cycle of, uh, destruction, in the Quran, successive generations destroyed, and Muhammad says it's all coming for us too. Mm-hmm. And then we look at the historical circumstances, the warring of the superpowers, the plagues, the earthquakes. It looks like the end, and Muhammad thought it was. And that seems to be the earliest uh, teaching of the messenger, mm-hmm. the earliest teaching of the Quran and the Hadith. And of course, the problem is this never materialized. And then it's real easy to suggest at that point that Muhammad's following just stopped after his death. It, it just diminished almost to the point of nothing. But then it was revived, resurrected. He did have a resurrection. It was resurrected by Abdul Malik and Al Hajjaj mm-hmm. in the late 7th and early 8th century. Mm-hmm. Without those two figures, we wouldn't have Islam. I, I really don't believe. And, you know, something else um, that's, that's interesting is that, um, well, yeah, I, th- I think that. Um, that, that Jay Smith has done a real good job of bringing this out as well. But when you think about the, how Islam was dropped by Muhammad and then picked up by Abdul Malik, Muhammad wasn't just a failed prophet you know, for the one true God. He he failed really as Satan's prophet. I mean, if you view Islam as a religion driven by Satan, and if you see Muhammad as um, a false prophet, he didn't even do his job. He didn't even do it well enough to to keep it sustained. It's something that Abdul Malik and Al Jaj had to pick up later on. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot of good polemic in there. But the, you know the core message to the Muslims is is hey, the earliest proclamation, the most uh, authoritative proclamation of your messenger we see in the Quran and the Deed, never materialized. It's been suppressed, and now Islam is all monotheism. Mm-hmm. Muhammad came to restore monotheism to the pagan Arabs, and that's just not how Islam began. All right, uh, we're you, you're going to see where uh, where we're going with this here in a in a minute. Uh, take a couple of comments real quick. Um, in the super chat, Cole of Centauri says, "My great great grandmother was a Spanish Jew, so I have some Jewish money. God bless y'all in Jesus' name." <laughs> uh, Just give us all that Jewish yeah. money. We need it all. <clears throat> SB, there's a rabbi knocking at my door right now. Just. Wait a second. SB in the super chat says, uh, thank you and God bless you, my brothers in Christ. I love, appreciate, and value your work very much. Uh, thank you, SB. And uh, Mr. 762 says, Muhammad is the Antichrist and Islam is a satanic cult. Hashtag change my mind. I would say Muhammad is an Antichrist um, because you, 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 you got more than one, I think. Um all right, and wanted to. Oh, also, uh, Doctor Funny joined the Boom Squad, and Doctor Funny is an actual doctor who is funny. Um, this is <laughs> this is kind of a kind of in a different direction here. But um, Jacob Lambert says, "Question for David and Colin: I really want to go into apologetics and talk about Islam, but my carers told me I shouldn't because I have PTSD. What do?" you think. Uh, I'll give you my thoughts, uh, Jacob, and then Colin can share his. Um, my thoughts would be, well, it kind of depends on the the, uh, the severity of the PTSD. But um, yeah, if, if, you know, if there is a psychological concern about you being uh, provoked or put in situations where people are going to be messing, you, messing with you or threatening you, uh, there are probably other things to do, uh, just to be, just to be on the on the safe side. Uh, now, with that said, you could do uh, apologetics by. I mean, gu- guys, one of the one of the most important things to do is like t- 
take our videos and, and share our videos and stuff like that. So stuff like that would be would be pretty safe. Uh, if you're talking about like going and you know going and having discussions with with Muslims and so on, uh, yeah, that would I would kind of depend on the on the seriousness of the PTSD. You don't want to you, you don't you you don't want to exacerbate uh, situations that uh, that you don't need to right? because there are other people who can do that sort of thing. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what he means by carers, but, you know, a decision to go into apologetics is that's, uh, I think, a decision that's going to be made with uh, you and uh, your church, you know, your pastors, your leaders and so forth. But really at the heart of it, um, what is apologetics? OK, apologetics is not a separate discipline. Mm -hmm. you, it, you don't have biblical studies over here and then apologetic studies over here. That's not how that works. You have biblical studies as the foundation. And then apologetics emerges organically from good Bible study. So in the one sense, in the sense that I define apologetics, yes, do apologetics, because apologetics is nothing more than solid Bible study and the sort of understanding that arises from it. So go do your apologetics um, as it relates to you know, public apologetics. Obviously, we don't know the details, but talk to the leaders of your church. They'll be able to help you out more than we can. Mm -hmm. um, one more here. Uh, David the Goliath said, do you think Muhammad and his wife Khadija may have followed some form of Christianity before Islam and Muhammad misunderstood terms like son of God to mean a literal son? Uh, there's no question that Muhammad misunderstood terms like son of God, but I think the question is, could this, uh, could this be connected to um, Muhammad's wife Khadija uh, following some form of, of uh, Christianity? Do you, you have any thoughts on that? It could be. I tend to, when I'm doing source critical work, not connect it to a specific person mm -hmm. um, because I don't know how Muhammad received um, these sources. What I do is connect it to a specific text. Okay, so um, if I'm looking at the Abraham traditions in the Quran, I'm going to go back to Genesis Rabbah. If I'm looking at the story of Joseph, I'm going back to Midrash Hagodal and Midrash Tanhuma. That's where I'm going to. I'm not really looking at this from the perspective of, of, okay, which person did this come through? Because I don't know what that person studied. I don't know what they were exposed to. But if I do see parallels within the form and, um, you know, the words like we're going to see here in, in our uh, Merkava mystical exegesis, if I see that kind of thing, that's what I latch on to. And building parallel after parallel, eventually it becomes clear that there's some borrowing going on. But as far as, you know, individual people, I don't try to attach my source critical arguments to a specific person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the, the idea, the idea of, of Khadija following some form of, of Christianity, this would have a lot to do with uh, uh, her, her cousin Wadika supposedly being someone who translated um, the gospel into Arabic. And it's basically one, I, I just don't know how much we can trust a lot of these sources. Um, so that's one, two, there, there are all kinds of sources for, I mean, if we take the basic Islamic timeline of what, of who Muhammad was and the people he was around, um, there are all kinds of people who could, who could, would have been an influence on Muhammad. So if he's going around with the, with the caravans earlier in life, well, he has all kinds of people, uh, to talk to, uh, later, I mean, he has a, he has a sex slave named Mary the Copt, so she would have had Christian traditions and so on. So... It's basically the Muslim sources are a mess and the, the life of Muhammad is a mess and his teachings are a mess. And we look back and say, what are the origin of these teachings? It's just kind of a, all kinds of places. So all kinds of possibilities. Mm. All right. So uh, do you ready to continue on to the next issue? On, on through the mess. You just said it's a mess. It is a mess. It, We're about to get into a mess for sure. All right. So. For those, for those who heard the word eschatology and were like, mm. ah, why are we going to talk about eschatology? Get ready, because we are going to talk about mysticism. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. What was missing from Muhammad's eschatological worldview uh, in our previous segment? Well, an antichrist. If you have an antichrist, you are surely at the end of the world. And uh, there's a figure in Islamic tradition. We're not going to talk about the later developments of this figure. We'll just talk about it as it relates to Muhammad's life. Uh, but there's this figure that Muhammad was actually uncertain whether or not he was the Antichrist. Really interesting stuff. So we'll just start with uh, introducing Merkava mysticism to some who watch my channel. You'll be familiar with this. 
though I think this discussion will still help you out a lot because it's a complex mess, as uh, David put it. Um, and, you know, we'll just start with sort of an introduction. Okay, so we'll start with the word. Merkava just refers to chariot or a throne chariot. It's a Hebrew word. Um, it's spelled with a B-A-H at the end most of the time, but the B in Hebrew doesn't have something called a dogish. So it's pronounced America Va with a V sound. Uh, but if you type it in Google, for whatever reason you'd want to do that, it's spelled with a B as in America Va. So like I said, it refers to a throne chariot. And America Va mysticism is something that draws off of ex esoteric, mystical exegesis of passages in the Bible like Ezekiel 1. So Ezekiel 1 just... You know, it's a very interesting uh, vision there that Ezekiel has. He's in exile, and to put it briefly, he has a vision of God on his throne. Really important that Ezekiel sees this because this is, as I said, during the exile. You know, the temple gets destroyed and, and so forth, and you have all of these people now, some of them still faithful, but they're outside of the Holy Land. They're outside of the borders. In the ancient Near East, gods were often uh, limited by geographical boundaries. And so if you go from one region to another, you cross the boundaries. Now you're in the territory of God, A, B, C, and D. And you pay your respects, you pay your homage to them. Ezekiel's outside of the borders of Israel, but he sees God on his throne. God is still sovereign. Moreover, God's throne goes wherever he wants it on a whim. So God is enthroned over the whole cosmos. And this is what Ezekiel sees. It's a really important message. This is the earliest form of mysticism that uh, we see emerging in the Taniatic period that would be starting in about the first century. A lot of these traditions are related to um, or, or go back to Rabbi Akiva, very big name, obviously. Um, I'm sure most people watching are familiar with Rabbi Akiva, once again, spelled with a B-A at the end, but pronounced with a V. And the goal of the Merkava mystic was to see what Ezekiel saw, to put it short. The temple was destroyed, obviously, in Ezekiel's time. When else was it destroyed? It was destroyed in A.D. 70. The temple was destroyed. Ezekiel saw a vision. The temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. Some rabbis started this mystical exegetical tradition. Think about this from a religious Jew's perspective, a, a Jew who's involved in the cultic worship at the temple. And I'm using the word cultic, not like Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, It's, it's a, a technical term. It refers to ritual worship. Okay, So you have Jews involved in cultic worship in the temple. You've rejected the Messiah. Now the temple is destroyed. How do you get close to God? And so the rabbis turn to their um, interpretive expansions to answer this question. So Merkaba mysticism developed. And uh, I think this was you know, brought on entirely or accelerated at least by the destruction of the temple. So how do you ascend or descend? The, the mystics are, are paradoxical. Okay, they acknowledge that God's throne is you know, in the seventh heaven and so forth, and the mystical goal is to ascend all the way up to God's throne room. So how do you do this? Well, obviously the first thing you do is you adjure the prince of the countenance, who is uh, a rather mysterious figure, and you adjure him exactly 112 times. And you're supposed to count them on your fingers as you do this. There is um, a, a list of Hebrew consonants. Of course, you know, Hebrew, you have the consonants and then you point it differently and it sounds differently. You vocalize it differently because you change the vowels. And so you re recite strings of these consonants. And if I, um, it's, it's in the other room, there's, there's actually a book. I could read some of those to you. We could all have a, a mystical experience together. Um, so that's something else that you do. Another preparation that you make is intense Torah study. You're going to have to have names of God written down because you're going to have to present these to angels who guard each one of the hekalot, each one of the hekal, the temples, the palaces, on the way up to God's throne room. You're going to have to show them these magical seals, and you're also going to have to know their names, which is very difficult because their names get more and more complicated the further you go. Okay, so some of the things the mystics would do is they would cloak themselves. Does that sound familiar? Uh, they would induce uh, these sort of trance-like states and, and mutter to themselves oh. and so forth. Um, I'm not – there's somebody else who did that. I just – I can't remember who it was. But um, anyway, we'll get to that. He's joking. Um, and he's, he's joking, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Go ahead. Everybody's like, 
Book of Revelation, Sly Hill Bacard. Um, brief intro to mysticism. Any um, any any questions that you see or, or anything I kind of left out to describe the origin, what prompted Barakova mysticism, the time period where it originated? Or you, you think we're, we're clear on that or no? Um, yeah. Any questions on how to adjure the prince, the countenance, or anything like that? I'm kidding about that one. No, I think we're good. Should we take a couple comments real quick? Okay. Great. Oh, oh, oh! I'm sure there's <laughs> there's some entertaining ones. Here. Oh no, no, no. That's uh, I try to I try to get the. Um, yeah, I try I try to just look at look for anything interesting, uh, whether it's related to the topic or or not. But um, Mike here uh, said Khadija's Christian cousin Waraka. Uh, bin Naufal bin Asad bin Abdulaza proclaimed Muhammad as a prophet. What is your take on a Christian starting Islam in a way? Uh, again, Mike, I'm not entirely confident in the historical sources, but if we go in a straightforward manner uh, from the Muslim sources, uh, here's what we would say. Muhammad's interpretation of what he encountered in a cave was that it was demonic, right? He ran out of there and tried to kill himself because he didn't want his people making fun of him as some sort of possessed poet. Uh, so he runs home to his wife when whatever it was that he encountered wouldn't let him jump off a cliff. So he runs home to his wife screaming, cover me, cover me, because uh, she's kind of a mother figure. Uh, Muhammad's Mom was would have been about 15 years older than him. She died when he was six. He marries a woman who's about 15 years older than him. Uh, this dude had all kinds of issues. But Muhammad runs home to Khadija, and Khadija, who sees that her husband is suicidal, and her cousin Wadika say, no, that you're not possessed. You're, you're a prophet. You're, you're getting revelations from God. So there are a couple things here. And, and the, reason we would, the, the reason we would bring these up is because uh, Muslims like to use this, right? Like as some sort of evidence. Ah, even Wadaka admitted that he's a prophet. This is the proof. One, we know next to nothing about this guy. Uh, two, who makes him a who who makes him a, an authority, right? Who makes him an authority? There are all kinds of people down through history who have said, "Oh, that guy's a prophet," and we don't listen to them, right? The the people who identified Joseph Smith as a prophet, those guys all would have been raised as Christians, right? Um, you don't say, oh, they are, they're raised as Christians. Therefore, you know, wh whoever they say is a prophet must be a, uh, must be a prophet. Uh, so one, assuming Wadaka, assuming Wadaka identified Muhammad as a prophet, we'd have to know what, what authority does Wadaka and Khadija have to say who is and who is not a prophet. Uh, so that's one issue. But, uh, apart from that, apart from that, think about the, think about what, Wadaka would have known about Muhammad's message uh, that early on, right? It would have been, oh, here's a guy among the Arabs who's running around preaching monotheism. That would have been about the extent, right? You, you, we don't have the, hey, and you have to violently subjugate the entire world, and uh, you know you have to subjugate all other groups, and anyone who says that Jesus is the son of God and stuff, uh, you have to subjugate them. You don't have that yet, right? Those things come later. So you can imagine someone who believes in Christianity, who sees a guy ri you know, rise up and start proclaiming monotheism, you can see why someone would say, hey, this guy's a prophet. So being as charitable as possible uh, with the sources, I think that's what I would, I would say. If we grant everything and say that Wadaka identified Muhammad as a prophet, it's no idea what authority Wadaka has, but even if he's very knowledgeable, you could say, well, this guy is proclaiming monotheism in a pagan culture, so looks like he's getting revelations. We don't know what Wadaka would have said about if he had been familiar with Muhammad's later revelations, if he were, in fact, knowledgeable about Christianity, about the Christian text. Then given things that Muhammad said later, long after Wadaka's death, he would have had to reject him. He would have had to reject him because Muhammad clearly and indisputably rejected the core uh, foundational doctrines of the Bible. What are your thoughts, Scotland? Yeah, as, as you indicate, there's a disconnect between Islam, as people say it in common parlance today, and the earliest proclamations of the messenger. Fred Donner's made a very good case that Islam began, now it didn't last too long like this, but it began 
as uh, sort of an ecumenical monotheistic movement. This is why we find approval statements in the Quran of Jews and Christians. Now, of course, that goes away later on. But Donner's point is that, you know, initially uh, this was it's an end of the world. Everybody's in. If you're a monotheist, you know, do you believe in God? OK, hey, you're in. Your scriptures are good enough. Surah 5, 43 through 48. The messenger says to the Jews, your scriptures are good enough. He says to the Christians and the Muslims can use the Quran. Everybody's in. And so, yeah, I think early it was early on. It was this sort of universal, once again, an ecumenical movement. And so it wouldn't have necessarily met with resistance from Christians or Jews. Now that changed obviously very quickly. I think it was a very short experiment, but so when you, there's a disconnect there when you say that, um, you know, someone else started or a Christian started Islam. Well, Islam then isn't what it is now. So I think the question's uh, moot in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, here's one from our good Muslim friend, Abdul Rahman Muhammad. He said, compare the Quran to the Bible. So this one we said uh, Muslim sources are a mess. Compare the Quran to the Bible. What's a mess? You believe that God died? Really? God died? He was tortured by his enemies? What a mess, the Bible or Quran? Um, uh, if you're going to make fun of Christian doctrine, you should at least accurately state it or try to understand <laughs> it. The claim is not that God, as he exists in eternity, uh, somehow died. It's that God entered into creation, took on flesh as Jesus of Nazareth, and it was for a purpose. It wasn't just he accidentally fell into the hands of his enemies. It's basically uh, God's justice is perfect. All sin has to be punished. Uh, but God's love and mercy are also perfect. Um, so what does a God who is perfect in justice and perfect in love and mercy do when confronted with human sinners, people like us who do bad things, what does he do? Well, justice would be calling for us to be punished. Mercy and love would be calling for forgiveness. What is God going to do? In Islam, the solution to this problem is to reduce and diminish God's attributes so that Allah just isn't very loving. He doesn't love unbelievers. He doesn't love all kinds of people. Um, that's, that's really the the, the main reason that people like Abdul Rahman here have in understanding the Gospels, they don't understand a God who would actually love them enough to do something like that. Uh, Allah just isn't that loving. But at the same time, Allah's justice, uh, Allah's justice is all messed up. Um, Allah can just let some sins slide if he wants. He can just say, eh, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to punish all these things. Or, as he does, according to Muhammad, he can take the sins of Muslims and put them on the backs of Jews and Christians. Uh, Allah's justice is all over the place. Um, but in Christianity, God's justice and love and mercy are all perfect. And so the solution to the problem of, of sin, God being confronted with human sinners, uh, is that God decides to pay a debt that, that we owe so that at the end of time, whatever you want to say about Christianity, um, at the end, all sin has been punished. Every last bit, justice is perfect. And yet look at what God did for us uh, to so that we could have forgiveness. Love and mercy are perfect. And so, Abdul Rahman, what, where, where's the mess? I mean, you have this prophesied in the Old Testament. God told us ahead of time that this was going to happen. Then it happened. It's confirmed by the guy who lived the most miraculous life in history. It's confirmed by endless witnesses. And your response is, oh, it's just a mess. What you mean is you don't like it. Your thinking has all been completely clouded by Muhammad, and therefore it's it's all a mess to you. But that, that's your problem, right? That's your problem. When we're talking about the Quran being a mess, we're talking about something completely different, right? If we're talking about Islamic theology being a mess, yes, Islamic theology is a complete, utter, total mess. Uh, but we're, we're, we're talking about things like the sources and where we're getting those sources and the history. It's all one big, massive mess. Even the Quran, right? It's a, it's a big, disorganized mess. It, 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 it constantly brags that it's perfectly clear and you don't need to go outside it to understand it. But you do. You can't understand it. It's not, it's not a, even arranged in chronological order. You've got passages that cancel other passages. One big, massive, horrible mess. So that's a fact. Um just just keep in mind though when you're when you're calling the bible a mess you're also talking about a book that your quran confirms your book your quran affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the jewish and christian text that you just called a mess so your book affirms what you call a mess that is sad dude you need to repent you're going to face allah for rejecting his words one day according to your according to your beliefs 
Uh, anything you wanted to add to that there, Colin? I just wanted to. He's been. Uh, he's been focused he's been, on, what, on what. He's been. Run, he's been running his mouth in the chat, so I just wanted to get okay. off that, even though it's kind of a tangent. You focused on what what God did, and that's the key. And it's put very very straightforward uh, in Romans three, and this is verse twenty six. It was to show His righteousness at the present time, so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What biblical theology does is that it puts the solution to the sin problem where it needs to be, and that's in God's realm. When we sin, we are out of God's presence. God is life, and so death follows. We have to die. Jesus took that death on himself, and he had to do that as God so that he could be just and the justifier. It's not something that we can do. Um, uh, Our sins are uh, an offense before God, and they need to be made right um, in a way that God approves of. When it comes to the Islamic doctrine of sin, I'm really not sure, but it seems to me something like when Muslims die, they're tortured in the grave, and then they cross over the bridge over hell. They may or may not make it. Who knows? But either way, they're going to have massive thorns tearing at their flesh as they cross. And then when they cross, they are going to retaliate on other Muslims for the sins committed in this life. And then they will be purified from the sins committed this life, and then they may get into paradise depending on if they may get past that one cubit line that Muhammad talked about where you could still go to hell. So when we think about the doctrine of sin between Christianity and Islam, I'm still going to maintain that uh, the doctrine of sin is a mess in Islam and the Islamic texts are a mess in Islam, in, uh, Islam mm-hmm. for a whole variety of different reasons. But it, it, seriously, though, to, to this person, the, you know, God is just – and the justifier in biblical theology, the problem of sin is put in the realm of God. That's where it needs to be because he's the only one who can provide a solution for the sin problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so in, in a nutshell, for, for the Muslims, you are not righteous enough to live in the presence of God. That means if you are ever going to live in the presence of God, you need a righteousness that does not come from yourself. You need a righteousness that comes from somewhere else. The gospel is a message about how God gives you his righteousness because you're not good enough on your own. In Islam, you're kind of on your own, in which case you are pretty screwed. You're you're in all kinds of troubles, dude. You're in all kinds of trouble. And what do you do? You make fun of it. You make fun of the Bible, and the Bible affirms, uh, I mean, the, the Bible is affirmed by your book. Uh, quick shout out to Nate, Loy- Nate Lawrence, who joined the Boom Squad, the greatest group in the history of humanity. Uh, and uh, uh, Theosis Redneck <laughs> in the super chat who said, for commercial viability. But those of you who don't know, don't know what he's talking about, YouTube said it's going to, uh, it reserves the right to uh, just cancel channels based on whether they're commercially viable. There's no reason for YouTube to do that except for the pos- except unless they're planning on banning lots of channels down the road based on their content and they want a justification. Uh, there is a quick comment here uh, from Jimmy Khan. Jimmy Khan, when I was talking about the Bible, said it's abrogated. I, I assume he's talking about, he's talking about, he's saying that according to the Quran, the Bible's abrogated. Uh, Jimmy, uh, if the Bible's been abrogated according to your Quran, then Allah is the worst communicator in all of history, the most absolutely horrible communicator ever. And that's what you're just telling me right now. Because what is, what, uh, Surah 5, verse 43, the Jews come to Muhammad to judge a dispute that they were having. Allah says, they come to Muhammad. So they come to Muhammad. They're saying, Muhammad, would you judge this judge this uh, dispute we're having? Allah says, why are they coming to you when they have the Torah? If it, and then he tells them, if they don't judge by the Torah, they're in rebellion against God. Does that sound like it's been abrogated? That it's no longer a play? Because it really sounds like Allah is saying, Muhammad, why do they need you when they already have their revelation? Right. Just a few verses later, directed towards Christians, Allah says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. If they, if any fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed, they are no better than those who have belt. And the next verse says that Muslims judge by the Quran. So if you actually read your book, which you obviously don't, Jimmy, if you actually read your book, you'd find <laughs> that the position of the Quran is that Allah has sent prophets into all the world, and this actually ties into some of what we were talking about earlier, um, the, the eschatological view and so on. Uh, the, the Islamic position is Allah has sent prophets into all the world, 
This is what you get from the, if it's what you get if you just read the Quran and don't put your own ideas into it. Allah has sent prophets into all the world. Different groups have their revelations. The last group to receive their revelations were the Arabs. They didn't have a book in their own language. They were the last group. Everyone else had a prophet in their own language except the Arabs. And Allah realized that the Arabs on the day of judgment would have an objection. They'd be able to say, wait a minute, why didn't we have a revelation? We would have served God better than all these other people if only we'd had a revelation in our own language. So Allah says, all right, I'm, I'm giving them Muhammad to give them a revelation in their own language. That way they won't be ignorant. Uh, but now that Muhammad has come, now every group has their revelation and each group needs to judge by its own revelation. Jews need to judge by their revelation. Christians need to judge by their revelation. And Muslims need to judge by their revelation. And so that's the position of the Quran. What happened was eventually Muslims started going out and actually looking at these other revelations and realizing, oops, these don't line up with Islam at all. They must have been corrupted. Even though according to the Quran, no one can change Allah's words. No one can change Allah's words. The Bible the Torah, the gospel were still authoritative for Jews and Christians. Makes no sense if they'd been corrupted. So, but they started realizing this. So they had to say corrupted. Why? They couldn't say the obvious, namely, hey, Muhammad didn't know what he's talking about. They'd get their heads chopped off for saying that. So they had to say corrupted. Uh, but fortunately, Jimmy, we're not in that position. We can look. We can look at Muhammad and say, okay, Muhammad thought that all the other revelations line up with him. They don't. Muhammad, according to Muhammad, no one can can corrupt Allah's words, but Muslims today say everyone's basic. Is there anyone who hasn't corrupted Allah's words? Because based on what Muslims tell us, every group that's ever existed, except Arab uh, Muslims, everyone has all uh, has corrupted their revelation. So massive problem. This is totally incoherent. And, and by the way, uh, Abdul Rahman, this is exactly some of the stuff we're talking about when we say that the Quran is a mess. Your book affirms scriptures that completely contradict your book. There are only two possibilities. Either we have the word of God or we don't. If we have the word of God, your book is false. If we don't have the word of God, your book is still false because your book affirms our book. So either way, your book is false. You need a new religion, dude. Get a new religion. Back to you, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> You're in rare form. I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, th this this question, it, it is a complete mess, like you said. And, and just in case it wasn't clear what we meant by all this, you take Surah 18, for example. Okay, here's what it looks like. Okay, Surah 18 to Muslims, it's the word of Allah. Here's what Surah 18 looks like. It looks like someone sat down on a table and they had um, some Syriac legends over here and some Christian legends over here and some Jewish legends over here. And they took a couple of pages out of each one of these and they stapled them together and there's Surah 18. That's what, in part, what we're talking about when we say the Quran is a mess. Then there's the problem that David's talking about where the Quran affirms the Torah and the gospel. But here's the problem. The Quran does not know the difference between Torah and Midrash. Mm -hmm. That is a huge problem. Huge. We've seen this in the um, in the video I produced on Abraham and Zarathustra. It's a little bit technical. I boil it down, uh, condense it a little more in a video I have coming out probably tomorrow on the Joseph story. You know, Surah 12. Um, this is where Potiphar's wife calls the assembly of ladies, and the, the Joseph so hot they cut their hands. Right. This comes from an exegetical expansion that's preserved in several Midrashim, Jewish interpretive texts, and I go back in Genesis 39 and I show you from the Hebrew where these exegetical expansions developed, and I show you how they developed, and I show you where they are in the Midrash, and then I show you the same thing in the Quran. So this is what we're talking about. I wish that Muslims could travel with me years ago, because here's what happened. I watched debates with, you know, David and um, others. This was back when Sam was, I guess Muslims are afraid to debate Sam now, but, you know, you have all of these different apologists. seems like uh, there were more debates back then. Maybe I just watched it, or I'm not sure. But one thing that was consistent with the Muslim apologists was that the Bible is corrupted. And so my first time reading the Quran, I thought I'm going to see this over and over again. And I read the Quran and not a single time, mm -hmm. not a single negative statement on either the Torah or the gospel. It also mentions the Psalms and it mentions the pages of Abraham, whatever on earth that is, mm -hmm. maybe the apocalypse of Abraham. And in fact, in my last trip through the Quran, because I go through periodically to make a new set of cross references and notes for the topics I'm tracking on. And my last I, I said, yeah, this is going to be time consuming, but I'm going to write down every time the Quran speaks positively of the Torah, the book of Moses, the gospel, whatever. And I got sick of it by about the third or fourth chapter. 
I'm done with this. It takes too much time. My logic is if I ever run into a Muslim with doubts and I give him all the, you know, the verses I've memorized and he wants more, I'll just open the Quran, point to a page, and chances are I'm going to be somewhere near where the Quran speaks well of the Torah. Over and over the Quran affirms the Torah, mm-hmm. and over and over it affirms the Midrash, the Jewish interpretive tradition. Mm-hmm. It does not know the difference. It is a huge mess, Muslims. It is a huge problem because your God does not know the difference between Midrash and Torah, between tradition and Torah. Yeah, so guys, th- th- if, if, you, if, th- if this is new to you, it's... This is a problem, and we cannot overstate how much of a problem this is, right? Because, uh, I mean, this is kind of 101 stuff, right? You have the Torah, right? You have the Torah, right? So you have the Torah in the sense of the, the, the five books of Moses, right? That's what that's what Jews were talking about with the law. But you you know you have you you could talk about it in other ways. You could talk about oral Torah and things like that. But th- that's the author of the Quran doesn't know the difference between that and from sources that come much later and sources that are basically commentaries of rabbis. The author of the Quran does not know the difference between the two, right? We would expect God to know the difference between the two. If the if the Quran actually goes back to someone like Muhammad, who isn't educated, who can't even read the text for himself, and he has to judge everything he's coming up with based on what he's hearing, well, guess what? There are there are Jews quoting the Torah and there are Jews quoting the Midrash. He doesn't know the difference. He just hears Jews quoting this stuff, right? So if the if the uh, if if the Quran comes from Muhammad or from some other source or something like that, we can understand that what doesn't make sense at all at all is the idea that this comes from that it comes from God because God, if he is omniscient in Islam, he should know the difference between uh, the Jewish sources. Uh, one quick uh, one quick uh, comment here and then uh, it'll be back to you, Colin. Uh, Wahid said, uh, how do you respond to someone who says that the Quran can't abrogate itself? Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Well, he, you, you hear this from, you hear this from Muslims nowadays who basically don't read their sources, don't read their materials. And they, they're looking for some sort of basis for saying that when the Quran talks about abrogation, it's actually talking about earlier scriptures and so on. Um, but these are people who have no clue what they're talking about. One, their most trusted Hadith collections are filled are filled with stories about Muhammad's companion saying this verse abrogated that verse. This verse abrogated that verse. So if they want to say they're wrong, then they're saying that Muhammad's companions, the people who learned the Quran from Muhammad himself, they all got this wrong and they didn't understand what abrogation meant and no one ever bothers to correct them. Muhammad never bothered to correct them and say, what? You're talking about what? You think abrogation is this part of the Quran uh, <laughs> abrogating that part of the Quran? Uh, second, if you go to the passages of the Quran that deal with abrogation, like 2106 and so on, uh, 16101. If you if you go to the commentaries on this, the historical background for the revelations of these verses were that the unbelievers were mocking the Muslims because their prophet kept contradicting himself, right? They were making fun of Muhammad saying, hey, your prophet your prophet reveals one thing one day and then he comes back later and reveals something totally different. What's going on with your prophet? That's the historical background. It would say in response to those guys pointing out that the Quran contradicts itself, in response to those things, then Allah revealed that, oh, you know, Allah can abrogate or cancel verses in favor of other verses, right? So that's the historical background. It's not an issue of uh, the Quran canceling prior revelations. Uh, Third, you have, according to the Muslim sources, all kinds of verses that aren't that were revealed as part of the Quran that aren't aren't in there anymore. So the verses about breastfeeding an adult ten times or five times. Uh, notice what you have. The the uh, it was revealed as part of the Quran that you uh, if you were worried about um, being sexually tempted around someone, then you know the the woman should breastfeed the man ten times, and then that was too much. So it got abrogated, changed to five times, and then people didn't like that. And then Aisha's sheep ate the verse, and so on. But you have. Uh, entire chapters of the Quran coming up missing in in uh, Sahih Muslim. Abu Musa talks about two entire chapters of the Quran coming up missing. He says that Muslims just hardened their hearts and weren't reciting them enough. Uh, over a hundred verses, according to Aisha, came up missing from Surah 33. 
Um, we know that this is just a case of people forgetting stuff because this is what happens when you don't write it down and you think that you can preserve it by memory and then the people who have it memorized get sent into battle and die. We know what the problem here is, but the only possible defense Muslims can have, as ridiculous as it is, is to say that all the passages of the Quran that were lost were abrogated. So if a Muslim wants to say the Quran cannot be abrogated or the Quran cannot abrogate itself, they have no defense of any of this. Muhammad's companions are unreliable. The Quran is hopelessly contradictory. The historical context makes no sense because, the, again, the historical background for these verses was that the Quran was contradicting itself and Muhammad was changing his revelations. And uh, Muslims have no explanation for why so many passages, entire chapters, large passages, individual verses, phrases were abrogated from the Quran. If they, if they throw out abrogation, they have to say these things were just lost. And so that would be my response, uh, Wahid. Um, and uh, in the super chat real quick, uh, Kara said, oh, dang it, it just went away. <laughs> I'll have to scroll down to it. All right. Khaled, did you want to get back to uh, our topics or did you, uh, did you want to add something on anything we've been discussing here? Let's get back to it. Let's get All back right. to it. Yeah. Um, so when we left off, we talked a little bit about uh, Merkabah mysticism, where it originated in time and how it originated from, uh, you know, texts like Ezekiel 1. We talked about the temple was destroyed in Ezekiel's time and he saw a vision. The temple was destroyed once again, of course, in the first century, AD 70. And so um, it's a problem for religious Jews. You know, how do we live out our religion, reject the Messiah? How do we how do we deal without a mm -hmm. temple? And so um, this gave rise to accelerated this whole mystical tradition. So story time, everybody. We'll go to um, Sahih al-Bukhari, and I'll just read a typical tradition, okay? As we go through um, this discussion with Ibn Sayyid and Muhammad, he's a, a Jewish boy mystic, okay? He lives um, in Muhammad's time in Medina, and what you're going to find is that these traditions are start to finish embarrassing for Muhammad. It's absolutely marvelous, miraculous, that they were preserved because at every step of the way, they're embarrassing. So I'll just read um, one example from Sahih al-Bukhari, then we'll, it's a lot to unpack and we'll uh, wade into the weeds uh, fairly deeply as we go through this stuff. But here we go. So this is Bukhari 6174, using an approved Muslim translation. Umar uh, talked about Muhammad and Ubay ibn Kaab. They went into the garden in which Ibn Sayyid was present. When Allah's messenger entered the garden, he started hiding behind the trunks of date palms. Okay, you know those little cartoons where you have like this, you know, rabbit going from one tree to the other, you know, and he's hiding behind the trees. That's what we have going on here. Muhammad is <clears throat> hiding behind the trunks of date palms, intending to hear something from Ibn Sayyid before the boy could see him. His, uh, he was lying on a bed, he was covered up with a sheet, and he was murmuring. Ibn Sayyid's mother saw the prophet and said, look, it's Muhammad. And uh, Muhammad's cover was blown. Ibn Sayyid stopped his murmuring. The prophet said, if his mother had kept quiet, then I would have learned more about him. So that's one example of these stories. Um, we see some occurrences also in Sahih Muslim as well as uh, Hanbal's Hadith collection. So these traditions are widely attested in a whole bunch of Hadith, and they consist of different units, okay? <clears throat> so let's start with the palm grove unit. Muhammad goes um, to this palm grove. He apparently knows where this Jewish boy mystic is hanging out, and he, you know, hides from tree to tree, and he's trying to sneak up on the boy to hear what he's saying. In the Talmud, there is, um, well, I'll just read it. I have it up here. In the Talmud, um, there is a mystic who never left a day in his life by studying the Mishnah, uh, Gemara, laws, and lore, details of the Torah, details of the scribes, etc., etc., calendrical, uh, <clears throat> calendrical computations, gematrias, the speech of the ministering angels, the speech of spirits, the speech of palm trees. Remember, the boy was in a palm grove. And great matters and small matters. Now, <clears throat> great matters is code, Talmudic code for mystical speculation. Okay, so this boy is in a palm grove, and he's cloaked, he's veiled himself, and he's in some sort of a trance, and he's murmuring. That's the palm grove unit. There's also the apostle unit, 
And this is where things get even more embarrassing for Muhammad, because this is where we find Muhammad. Um, he's asked by Ibn Sayyid, he says, do you declare, he says this to Muhammad, do you declare that I am an apostle of Allah? And Muhammad says, do you declare that I'm an apostle of Allah? I believe in Allah and all of his messengers. And these are the same sort of ambiguous responses that we see um, commanded in the Quran as well. When you come up against something you're not sure of, eh, just give an ambiguous response and that's good enough. Mm -hmm. There is the smoke unit. This is another really embarrassing unit in these stories. And this is where so, Muhammad so, so, sounds like oh, yeah, a, yeah. sounds like it'd be a cool name for like a band or something like that, like a rap group, smoke unit, or something like that. The smoke unit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> be cool. All right, go ahead. Sorry, maybe, maybe a seventies <laughs> band. The uh, <laughs> punk, a punk band, punk band. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so the the smoke unit, the 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 nineteen seventies punk band. Um, this is where Muhammad says, "I'm concealing something in my mind. What is it?" And Ibn Sayyid answers him. He says, "It's just smoke." And so what this is, is this is a way that you test the powers of a clairvoyant. You're concealing something in your mind, and you ask them what it is. And the Muslim sources record this boy knowing what Muhammad is thinking. It's just embarrassing. Like I said, start to finish. Absolutely fascinating that this stuff is preserved in the Muslim texts. Mm -hmm. There's the throne unit. Okay, and this is where things get really interesting. Remember I said Merkava is the Hebrew word for throne. There's the throne unit. This boy is in a trance, and Muhammad says, what is it that you see? And the boy says, I see a throne over water. And there's a variant tradition along with these that actually contains the word hayot, which is the living creatures that we hear about in Ezekiel chapter 1. These living creatures that bear the throne. That word shows up again, a cognate in Arabic, in these traditions. So this is, aside from everything else, the palm grove covered up with a blanket, the murmurings. Um, this throne vision that the boy is seeing is really what clues us into an authentic Merkava vision that this boy is having, or at least trying to have. Are we good so far? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the um, th and this is where the Antichrist issue comes up because there's the Umar unit where Umar says, uh, "Do you want me to kill him? <laughs> Do you want me to chop his head off?" He's a nice guy, right? And uh, Muhammad says, "If he is who I think he is, you won't be able to kill him. And if he's not," It won't do any good. Once again, these sort of ambiguous responses that Muhammad gives, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what to think of this mystic Ibn Sayyid. Interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. The Sahih Muslim, there's another interesting detail. This is an objection I've gotten from Muslims a couple times. So this is the throne unit. And we have, once again, this ambiguous sort of question-answer period. Uh, the messenger of Allah said, said to him, do you bear witness that I am the messenger of Allah? And by the way, this is um, – I'm using the Dar al-Salam. So this is 7346 or 2925. Do you bear witness that I am the messenger of Allah? And he said, do you bear witness that I am the messenger of Allah? The messenger of Allah said, I believe in Allah and his angels and his books. What do you see? So once again, that ambiguous Q&A. He said, I see a throne over the water. The messenger of Allah said, you are seeing the throne of Iblis or Iblis over the sea. So I've had Muslims bring this up because this was in my previous video uh, of uh, where, where I published a video on this topic. And somehow they think that that's some sort of a refutation. I'm not quite sure why. But this gets into some really problematic issues because what you have in the throne unit is this boy seeing a throne over water and Muhammad saying – that's the throne of Satan. So Muhammad knows exactly what this boy is doing. He knows exactly what this boy is seeing. And he's not disapproving of the mystical processes that the boy is employing. He's actually sneaking up on him, trying to figure out what the boy is up to. It's really interesting stuff. But how would Muhammad hear that the boy or see what the boy is seeing, whichever it is, it's not clear. Is Muhammad in the trance with him or is he outside of the trance? How would Muhammad say you're seeing the throne of Satan over water? There are two answers to this question. I'll give one answer that's, that's 
I think, plausible, but then the second answer is probably closer to the truth because we see um, a parallel to this in the Quran. So the boy sees a throne over water. Muhammad says it's the throne of Satan. For those who really want to dig into this, and I'll, I'll speak about it in very specific terms and then um, less specific, there is a rabbinic method of interpretation where you see a word, especially a verb, in a particular stem. You know, Hebrew has a whole bunch of verbal stems. And these words have different nuances and different stems. And if you see the same word in the same stem in two different passages, well, in rabbinic interpretation, you can bring those two together and you can use one to interpret the other. So what happens is you have this hith pale verb of halak, which means to go or to walk. So you know, HLK, to go or to walk, to travel, that's halak in Hebrew. The hith pale stem is iterative. So we have different words in English. We walk somewhere, but we pace back and forth. Hebrew is not like that. It's just um, halak, you go, you walk somewhere. If you want to use an iterative function, if you want to have that iterative nuance, you just put it in a different stem, in this case, the hith pale stem. So here you go, Job 1.7, Halak occurs in the hith pale stem. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and here, here it is, and from walking up and down on it. And that's actually a, I don't really like that translation. The NIV renders it uh, walking back and forth, which is it's better. The up and down is, is odd to me. But there you have it, okay? Now, what happens is when you go to Ezekiel 1.13, Okay, so, so you have the accuser there, the Hasetan in Job. Ezekiel 1.13, as for the likeness of the living creatures, the Chayot, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro, there it is, among the living creatures. And so the rabbi said, well, you have this hith pale verb that occurs in Job 1.7. You have the same thing that occurs in Ezekiel 1.13. There's a connection here. And so they connected the accuser or the sort of that evil role that's played in Job 1 with the chayot to bear the throne. It sounds really bizarre, but that's what the rabbis did. And mystical exegesis developed this further because what you have in the mystical literature is this angelic jealousy motif. OK, the humans don't belong up, you know, ascending through the, the palaces, through the heavens. They don't belong there because they're just humans. And so the angels who guard these palaces would often take action against the mystics who were trying to make the ascent. And sometimes they do this without God's favor. And in some cases, they're thrashed and then burned and replaced with others. And so there's this overlap, believe it or not, between the chayot, the living creatures who bear the throne, and demonic angels or evil angels. And so... In seeing this boy's vision, you know, you're seeing this throne over water. Muhammad may have been influenced by these traditions that see the creatures who bear the throne also overlapping with evil angels. So that's one possibility. There's a second possibility, though, and this is attested in the Quran as well. And that is that when you get to the sixth heaven, okay, you look in and, and there are various tests for the mystics along the way. Okay, and here's one. You get to the sixth heaven, and you see what looks like water. And if you say, what's the deal with this water, then you're exposed as a fraud. Okay, it's actually mm -hmm. technically telling a lie, according to the Talmud, and then it just does not look good. It really doesn't. You're um, impaled with a whole bunch of iron bars, or you're beheaded, or whatever it is. Do not fail this test, okay? Don't fail this test. So... When we go to the Quran, we see in Surah 27, 44, remember the test. You're approaching uh, the palace. You're approaching the throne. You see the water. If you say it's water, you fail the test. Surah 27, 44, the queen of Sheba was told, enter the palace. But when she saw it, she thought it was a body of water and uncovered her shins so she doesn't get them wet. He said that Solomon, indeed, it is a palace whose floor is made with smooth glass. She said, my Lord, indeed, I have wronged myself, and I submit with Solomon to Allah, Lord of the worlds. And this is part of the mess that we're talking about with the Quran. Because what happens is back in the Tinaitic period, Tinaitic period, there is something called the Hekalot literature. Okay, Hekal is temple, palace, it's plural, so it gets the plural, ot ending. So you have the Hekalot literature. There are various recensions of this. 
And there are two traditions preserved in this literature. This is very early stuff, well before the Quran, Muslims, and it shows up in the Babylonian Talmud as well, which is, again, before the Quran. One tradition is the four who entered paradise, okay? So Rabbi Akiva, who we talked about earlier, and some of his companions, they attempt to make the ascent, and calamity falls on all of them except for Akiva. He goes in, and he comes out in peace. He makes it okay. One of them is fooled, and this is later connected in the Hecalote literature in a different recension to the water episode. And the water episode so originally separate from the four who entered paradise, and the water episode is just as we've described it. When you see the water, do not say, water, water, that's a trick. You failed the test. You're out. You're a failed mystic. You're going to die. You're going to be driven crazy or something like that. These two traditions were combined in Hecalote literature, and we see them represented in the Talmud as well. Um, so this will be the four who entered paradise, and they are, then it gives the name of the rabbis, including our famous uh, Rabbi Akiva. And um, Rabbi Akiva says to them, when you get to the stones of pure marble that look like water, do not say water, water, for it is said, and then it quotes uh, a psalm as scriptural proof that um, you are a liar. So when I saw this, you know, just just imagine you're you're reading through this mystical literature I don't even remember this verse was in the Quran, but then I saw it and my jaw dropped on my last trip through the Quran. I said, I know exactly where this is from, but I bet I'm not the first one to think of this. And so then I started looking and Christopher Morey Jones, David Halperin, and several scholars have published on this, that, that you know, they've traced this tradition from the Hecalote literature, you know, to the Talmud. It shows up in the second Targum of Esther as well and right to the Quran. And so the Quran just full stride through this story of Solomon, jams in this tradition from the Hegelote literature and then keeps right on going. Absolutely fascinating how that works. But back to, you know, Muhammad and seeing the throne of Satan. Once again, Muhammad could have interpreted the boy's vision as him failing this test. He failed. He thought it was water. He thought it was a throne over water. He failed the test. He's out. He's a failed mystic. And so Muhammad attempts to issue a correction. So... Everybody with us so far? Yep, I think so. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. <laughs> We're um, wading through the weeds a little bit, but not too much. Well, the the plus side, the plus side of having a having a live stream like this is it's a video later. So if it's too fast yeah. for anyone, you can always go back, go back and go through it. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, for anyone who's for anyone who's uh, tuning in late, we are. There's always an ongoing issue of where Muhammad's stories and teachings came from. Because even if you just look at like a, a surface level, right? If you, just, if you just scratch the surface, Islam just looks like a, a combination of uh, Jewish teachings, heretical Christian teachings, and pagan practices around him at the time. In other words, if you take... Uh, a lot of the what's in the Jewish sources, a lot of the things the Jews would have been talking about, a lot of the things the heretical Christian groups would have been talking about, and a lot of the pagan practices practices that are around him, and you roll all of that up into a ball, you get Islam, right? So it looks like this is a guy who's just taking, who just can't distinguish between anything that he's interpreting, and he's just trying to compile all of this uh, into his religion. So that's what it looks like on the surface. The question is, how deep can you go with this stuff, right? Uh, when you look at very specific teachings in the Quran or in the Hadith, uh, can you actually trace those things back? Can you trace them back to the certain teachings of Jewish rabbis or things like that? And that's what we're working on now. Um, so did you want to continue along those lines? You want to take a couple comments or what? Well, well uh, what you're talking about, you know, tracing these things back, and that's that's really the key is looking at the parallels. And when the parallels begin to stack up, mm -hmm. you know, this is what this is how you make a really strong case. Mm -hmm. And so there are several, um, you know, touch points in the Quran with mysticism. Surah 73 and 74 start off with vocatives. O you wrapped in a garment. O you cloaked one, arise and warn. And so when we talk about Ibn Sayyid, you know, in these mystical practices, and we talk about Muhammad as well appealing to these mystical practices, it's not just in the Hadith. Now, it's in several different collections, but it also shows up in the Quran as well. Surah 73, Surah 74, um, Surah 27, 44. Once again, going back to the Hecalote literature, you have two 
theophanies in the Quran that were, looks like, covered up later. Um, some interpreters like Jalalain want to say, well, no, he saw, he, you know, he saw Gabriel because you can't see Allah in Islamic theology. But once again, we're talking about the earliest proclamations of the messenger and the earliest beliefs of Muhammad. When we do that, we go right back to Merkava mysticism, among other things. And exactly what David said, what you, what you see with the Quran is this whole ball of Jewish and Christian tradition and legend and folklore and Syriac folklore and all of this stuff just rolled into one. We keep coming back to this whole it's a mess thing, but we're trying to, to, to guide uh, the viewers through some of, the, uh, some of the weeds of this mess. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, everyone who's watching... Um Obviously, obviously, um, Colin and I, if you, you know, look at the videos on his channel, compare them with the videos on my channel, there's obviously a lot of overlap. We do cover a lot of the same issues because we respond to Muslim apologists and things like that. Uh, but also notice he deals with a lot of stuff that I don't deal with, right? That I don't focus on. So um, his link to his channel is in the description box. So just, you know, if you're, if I'm assuming you're here because you're interested in, uh, issues dealing with Islam and Christianity and so on. So make sure you are subscribed to his channel. Again, the link is in the description box. Uh, take a couple quick, quick comments real quick. Uh, <laughs> this is from earlier from Abdul Rahman. Um, he said, your book, it was not corrupted. Um, I don't recall even bringing that up. I'm saying, according to your book, our book is not corrupted, right? If you're saying it's a mess, then you are attacking your own book and your own God and your own prophet because your own God and your own prophet affirm not only the initial inspiration, but also the preservation and the authority of my book. And so when you say it's a mess, you just, you just made fun of your own God, dude. You just made fun of your own prophet. You made fun of your own book, which affirms my book. So you got some repenting to do. Now, you said, because I could have sworn your Christians admitted that, admitted that it's corrupted. Um, no, this is called equivocation. Um, you don't know what's going on here. Uh, let me break this down for you. We talk about things like textual variants. Why? Because it's just a fact that there are textual variants. A textual variant means if you have multiple manuscripts of the Bible, and we have a lot of them, um, if you look at different manuscripts, sometimes you'll th see things like spelling differences and so on. Uh, in the in the in the strongest in the strongest cases you have you have a couple of different you have a couple of passages that will be missing from one manuscript that are present in another so that's what we mean by textual variant uh i don't call that corrupted for for me it, to say it's corrupted would mean that the the doctrines are actually changed to be something else you don't find that you don't find that so you have textual variants if that's what so that's not what i mean by corrupted if that's what you mean by corrupted then your book is corrupted, right? You see, your book is corrupted. Why? Because you can line up manuscripts of the Quran and see all kinds of textual variants. See, uh, what, what Muslims don't seem to get is, guys, anytime you have human beings involved in a practice, you're going to have things like this. If you say, hey, uh, copy this book by hand, you're going to have some textual variants. A lot, a lot of them are things just like spelling differences. Like you can spell the, the, the Greek for John with one N or two Ns, right? So that counts as a textual variant. If, if one manuscript has John spelled with two Ns and the other one has it spelled with one N, those count as textual variants. Um, so the question is, what, what, what do you mean by corruption? If you mean, hey, there are textual variants, guess what? Your book's been corrupted. Uh, but to say corruption, you'd also have to ignore that we have something called textual criticism, where uh, where when you have a manuscript and it says something different, you can usually trace that back to where it comes from, right? Because if some guy copying uh, copying a manuscript in the Middle East makes a mistake, well, that mistake doesn't pop up in manuscripts from Europe or Northern Africa or something. So you can usually you can usually spot them. So again, if that's what you mean by corruption then you've got a problem too because you have the same issue with the Quran. But that's not, that's not what I mean by corruption. Um, you said, furthermore, I think when the Quran says, go back to the people of book, I think that's before it was changed. So you're saying the Bible was changed after the Quran? Well, you, 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 got, you got multiple problems there. One, the Quran says no one can change his words. It doesn't say no one can change his words until right now. Right? That's not what it says. Two, we have copies of the entire Bible before the time of Muhammad. So if you're saying it changed afterwards, we've got copies of it before. So notice, Abdul Rahman, 
you have no idea what you're talking about. You don't know what the situation with, uh, is with the Quran. You don't know what the Quran teaches. You don't know the situation with the Bible. And somehow you're trying to fit all of this together. You don't know what abrogation means. You don't know any of this. You don't know anything. And yet you're filling the comments section trying to share your great wisdom with people who's, who dedicate our lives to studying this stuff. How does that how does that make sense in your head, right? If if I were to, there are all kinds of topics that 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 I don't know about, right? I mean, if I were if 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 I were sitting down in a chat with someone who who deals with you know quantum astrophysics, I would keep my mouth shut. I would keep my mouth shut. I would not sit there and proceed to tell these guys who've dedicated their lives to quantum astrophysics. I would not proceed to tell them all my thoughts on quantum astrophysics because I would have no clue what I was talking about. I would sit there and try to learn something from people who've dedicated their lives to it. You have no clue what the Quran teaches. You have no clue what the Bible teaches. You have no idea about history. And you keep you keep trying to correct the rest of us. Dude, dude, we love you. But uh, try again. Um Hey, uh, here's one from uh, Johan. This is a more serious one. He says, uh, may you guys pray for me because I'm struggling in finding Jesus. I want to embrace him. So he says um, he's struggling to find Jesus. He wants to embrace him. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Colin? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll pray for you. It can be a long journey for some. I mean, we don't know what's behind this comment. We don't know the personal circumstances, but uh, the, re the request, I don't have the uh, the comment up on my screen, but it, it sounded like a request for prayer, and that's certainly something that we can do. Absolutely. I actually, um, I have these sorts of things in my email, um, and you know, sometimes I don't respond because it's a lot of them. Sometimes it's in the form of a comment. And it will be some Muslim saying, you know, would you pray for me or something of that sort. And so that's I leave those there on purpose mm -hmm. as a reminder, it, not just for them, but for all the Muslims who are, um, you know, impacted by the channel and elsewhere. And that's a reminder for me to pray. And so I will certainly do that as well. I'm sure many Christians in the chat. Yeah, everyone pray for Johan. Uh, Johan, also, uh, if you want to, you say you want to embrace Jesus, it's a good idea to learn all you can about Jesus and... That would, that would this would be a good time to, to do some reading, right? So uh, read through the Gospels, get to know Jesus. The more you know about Jesus, the more you'll want to embrace him. Uh, and one more, one more comment. This was from earlier in the Super Chat, but I still had it pulled up. Uh, Pitar said, how do you respond to people who say, but the Bible is, uh, but the Bible is violent? Um, I assume you're meaning as a response to the claim that, that the Quran is violent. Uh, it says, also, I noticed that when Jesus was tempted in the desert, he resisted what Muhammad wanted. So, yes, Jesus resisted all the things that, that Muhammad wanted with every fiber of his being. Um, but the question is, uh, how do we respond to the, the claim that, that the Bible is violent? Um, well, he, here again, we have, this is called equivocation, right? We're use, using a word in two different senses, right? If I say the Quran is violent, I mean that the Quran, if you read it from beginning to end, it's actually calling for violence. It's calling for ongoing violence. I don't mean that the Quran contains some examples of violence, right? I mean, in other words, when I, if you take a, a, a history book, a history book of World War II, that contains a lot of violence. What do you mean if you say this book is violent? Do you mean, hey, if you read this book, there's a lot of violence in there? Uh, that's not the same thing as saying this book is violent in the sense that it's promoting violence. A, a book, a history book on World War II is not calling for violence. It's not saying, hey, go out and, and carry out violence, right? So when we talk about the Quran, we're talking about a book that contains violence, right? It contains stories of violence, but it also commands people to go out and commit violence. Now, if we're talking about the Bible, are we in the same situation? Well, there were times when God called on people to commit violence. If you're talking about what I would call the final marching orders of the Bible, in other words, if I read the Bible right now and I say, what am I commanded to do? I am not commanded. There is no command directed towards me or to other Christians to commit any sort of violence. We are commanded to love everyone. We're commanded to love even our enemies. We're commanded to live in peace with all men to the extent that it that it is on us. Um, so the point is, we're talking about... Yes, both the Bible and the Quran would agree that God has called for violence in certain situations. Uh, both the Bible and the Quran talk about the wars, the wars of Joshua and so on. So you've got those things. Uh, we agree that the future is not going to be pretty. There's going to be a, a pretty, pretty brutal judgment in the future. But if we're talking about what our books command us to do right now, if you read the Quran, the final marching orders, the marching orders for Muslims in the world right now is 
when you are in a position to violently subjugate people, you violently subjugate the unbelievers, right? Um, if you're not, then maybe you don't. Maybe you sit back and, and proclaim that Islam is a religion of peace if you're not in a position to do that. Uh, if you're a Christian, what are you commanded to do right now? You're commanded to live in peace with all men, right? So that that's so. if we're talking about the whether the Bible is violence, as far as what we are commanded to do as Christians, yet I don't think you can get much more peaceful than commanding us to love everyone, including our enemies, and telling us to live in peace with all men. You, you, this is us waging war right now. You're, yeah. you're seeing it. We're waging war. Yeah. <laughs> Christians it's on the war path. Yeah. So I hope that's <laughs> as bad as it gets. Uh, hope that answers your question, Johan. Uh, if, if you're if you're interested in more specific passages, I would recommend watching my debates with Shabir Ali. We had two debates on uh, two topics. Um, one was, is the Quran a book of peace? And the other was, is the Bible a book of peace? So um, that's me going against a top-notch Muslim apologist uh, who deals with, who's dealt with those topics in multiple debates before. So you can get sort of our, our, our best responses to those issues. Um, all right. Back to you, Colin. Did, did you want more on uh, the mysticism issue or did you want to go on to Deuteronomy 18? Well, just a, a pit stop by that corruption question, because it's really something that I want Muslims to be able to dialogue about more intelligently. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that, and I, I sincerely want to explain this to our, our Muslim audience, it's not something because of the way Muslims have been brought up in their theology. So, the corruption of the Quran is not something that's in their plausibility structure. So we all grow up with different beliefs that are shaped by society, by religion, whatever. And we either accept or reject information based on whether or not we think it's plausible. And these you know, have all of these sociological factors built into them. Muslims, because of the way that they are brought up, um, if we say something like the Quran is corrupted, it's outside of their plausibility structure. They automatically reject it. This can't be right. This is not what I've been brought up to think. But the fact is that's just wrong, and I would ask you to consider that. And don't talk about text criticism with the Bible and with the Quran. Okay, don't compare the two because here's the problem. I sold a house recently. And let's just, it was it's an old house uh, before I bought the, the mansion that the Jews are paying for now. It's, a, it's an old brick ranch house built in the 70s, and I have a neighbor. Okay, let's imagine both of us put our houses on sale at the same time. I get an inspection on my house. The home inspector goes through it. You got some moisture in the basement. Uh, you have a little bit of electrical work that needs to be done. You have this and that. Okay, my neighbor comes over later and he sees the inspection report. He says, your house is a mess. Look at this. You have moisture in the basement. You need to get some electrical work done, etc." And I say, what about your inspection report? Well, I didn't get one done. My house is fine. How do you know it's fine? You haven't checked. And see, that's the key. Muslims haven't checked. Their scholars have not checked the Quran. And so when Asalalu and Al-Takulic went through the Quran, they wanted to make a text-critical edition of the Tokabi and the Tashkent, and they decided not to because the Tashkent was too horribly corrupted. That's how Muslims do text criticism. Text-critical work on the Quran, having been neglected for centuries, is now being done primarily by Western scholars. Mm -hmm. Muslims are like the people who are selling their house without an inspection report. You have no idea what kind of shape your text is in. Christians are like the ones selling their house with that inspection report completed. And we can say, yep, there's some moisture in the crawl space. We have some electrical work done, but the foundation is solid. The structure is solid. Everything works just like it should. Mm -hmm. And so that's the difference. So Muslims do not stand on top of the mountain of centuries of text criticism on the Bible and act like you can compare that to the Quran because you can't. And when it all comes down to it, you cannot define textual corruption without excluding the Quran. When you use the word corruption, you are including the Quran in it because the text, the manuscripts of the, of the Quran have been thoroughly corrupted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I realize that's outside of your plausibility structure, but it's true, and it's something that you need to start looking into. Mm -hmm. You're going to be forced to. You know, think about the yeah, development we're, of text criticism. We're, we're on, going to make you. <laughs> Yeah, we're exactly. going to make the, you. <laughs> the Muslims have held back the avalanche of criticism, right? Because mm -hmm. when this stuff, think about how long it took a journal article to uh, go from one side of the world to the other back in the you know beginning of the, the 20th century or whatever. This is when text critical work is being done on the Bible. All of this work, this critical work, whether it's text critical, source form, historical criticism, whatever, this is all being done in the age 
of the internet with Islam. And Muslims have been holding back this avalanche for centuries, Mm -hmm. but it's coming down on them. And they can't stop it. Mm -hmm. It's coming through on the internet, the radio, the TV, whatever. And they can't stop it. You will have to deal with this one way or another, sooner or later. And it might as well be sooner. Yeah, uh, Islam did a good job uh, holding back all, all kinds of all, all kinds of criticism, not just text criticism for for many centuries. When you basically had the leaders in charge, and uh, they could they could insulate they could insulate the people in their countries and in their territories from ever hearing any serious presentation of the criticism, because if you went in there and started criticizing Muhammad or the Quran or whatever, uh, they'd chop your head off. So they were able to do that. And now, guys, there's this little thing called the Internet that we were talking about earlier, and you guys are in all kinds of trouble because your entire religion has been propped up on a foundation of complete, utter, total lies. And I don't mean, oh, I disagree with you, so I'm going to call it a lie. I mean, when your leaders tell you, perfect preservation, right down to the letter, no variance anywhere, that is a complete, utter, total lie. It is one of the most most ridiculous and absurd lies ever. And every every Muslim you'll run into believes it. And so when you when you multiply these kinds of things, you're making our job easy because you're making it easy for a small group of Christian apologists to just come in there and wreak havoc on all the lies you've told. And a lot of you Muslims out there are going to be sitting there looking at this going, wow, my leaders told me one thing all my life and it's completely, utterly, totally false. Maybe I need to stop trusting these liars. And then you're on your way out of Islam. Uh, here's another one from uh, Abdul Rahman Muhammad. He said, "So a man who can't read, <laughs> could you do what he did by changing a nation with over 1.6 billion? <laughs> An illiterate can do that. He is closer to the way of Abraham than you. He commanded worshiping one God. Um, Abdul Rahman, I would recommend you." Uh, uh, look at the series on my channel, The Trinity in Jewish and Christian Scripture. If you think Muhammad's in line with Abraham, you obviously haven't read the sources. But guess what? We already know that because you don't know anything about Islam or or Christianity. You don't know about the Bible. You don't know about the Quran. Once again, you're here trying to correct us with a very, very silly argument. You're saying, how could Muhammad, who's illiterate, have invented a religion that convinced 1.6 billion people in the world today? Uh, it, it's very simple. Uh, we and we know this. We can look at the Muslim sources. Uh, basically, Muhammad went around, and when he was going around, uh, saying, "Hey, everyone, believe in my religion, believe in Islam," because you know my lovely Arabic. He won almost no followers because, well, that's, let's face it, that's a really, really stupid argument. Uh, it was later when he said, "Guys, join me, join me, fight with me. We'll divide up the spoils. We'll share the spoils of war. We'll take these. We'll take. We'll go and conquer an area. We'll take the women as our sex slaves. We'll take the property. We'll kill all the men. We'll take all their stuff. We'll just keep taking and taking and taking. And oh, by the way, if you join me and you happen to die while we're taking everyone else's stuff and enslaving all these women." You'll just go to paradise where Allah is going to give you dozens of specially designed sex lays and you'll get even more in paradise. So win-win, right? No matter what happens, you join me, you join me, you join my team. You're going to go conquer people, take a bunch of stuff. It's going to be killing and, 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 and raping and everything that you love. That's what we're going to do. And if you die, you get even more of it in paradise because Allah is a cosmic pimp. My God is a cosmic pimp, right? That's the message that won tons of followers. And if you then combine that with, oh, by the way, once you join up, once you join up with my religion, you can't leave because we'll chop your head off. That is a religion that can only expand, right? Conquest, fighting, raping is all built into it. An obsession with these things. It gratifies the the basest human desires. It says, yeah, and it, it puts God's stamp of approval on that, right? If you can, if you can walk up to someone and say, hey, what do you want? Oh. You want to go around uh, boning lots of women and taking lots of money and seizing lots of territory and uh, getting violent with other people and killing other people? Well, guess what? In my religion, God loves all that stuff and God wants you to do that. That's a religion that is going to spread, my friend. That is a religion that is going to spread like wildfire. And so that's what happened with Islam. So, dude, we know exactly how Islam spread. And, of course, you get down to the modern period where you have lots of people who don't like lots of that stuff. But by the time you get down to our our time, Islam has morphed 
itself with so many lies, so much deception that it's become basically whatever any any person wants, right? Islam comes to the West and whatever, oh, oh, you like science? Well, guess what? Islam is the religion of science. Oh, you're a feminist? Oh, Islam is, a, Islam is the religion of women's rights. Oh, you're, you're against violence? Oh, Islam pr promotes peace. It's a religion of peace, man. It, it, it adapts itself to appeal to anyone. And the Muslim preachers who do this don't care at all whether they're lying. They just don't care. And so that's how your religion has gotten to where it is today. Apart from that, if you're talking about, if you're just going with the numbers, 1.6 billion, we know where that is. Islam creates such horrible backwards countries with nothing for women to do that Islam has the highest birth rates, right? Islam just has by far the highest birth rates in the world. That's why it's expanding so rapidly. So we can look at why it expanded rapidly in the beginning and at various stages in history. We can look at why, it, why it's expanding now. None of this has anything to do with whether it's from God. We, we know exactly why Islam spreads. None of it has anything to do with whether it's from God. If you look at why Islam is spreading right now in the world, it's high birth rates. If you look at why Islam is spreading in, in, the, in the West, it's primarily due to immigration, people fleeing Muslim countries as fast as they can because no one wants to live there. It's like every single th every single reason for the spread of Islam has to do with something horrible, some horrible, abominable practice or teaching. And you're saying this is your evidence for your religion. Wow. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. All right, Colin, back to you. <laughs> Well, as far as on this comment, as far as um, worshiping one God and the, the sorts of things that Muhammad taught, I would encourage this person to go back and watch the live stream again and don't mute it this time because he obviously hasn't heard anything that we've said. With respect to 1.6 billion Muslims need to stop making this claim because Muslims very commonly make two claims. One, they inflate the number of Muslims and two, apostates were not true Muslims. That's a contradiction. Because unless you can predict for me how many people will apostatize, you cannot predict how many true Muslims you have. So you can make one claim or the other. You can say that there are lots of Muslims, and yes, they are authentically leaving the religion. Or you can say, yeah, we have no idea how many Muslims there are, because when people apostatize, they weren't actually Muslims in the first place. So this is just a convenient claim that they like to make and uh, very problematic. Uh, but again, just watch the live stream it's almost like this person is is just has it on mute and it's just uh you know filling up the the chat with with this kind of stuff <laughs> and and he and he's not stopping look i'm i'm being as generous as possible by pulling these comments up but here's <laughs> abdul rahman again if islam was a religion that grew because it was about taking spoils killings people that wouldn't work current day no because because now you have more powerful militaries that would stop you, right? So it worked in the past. Islam expanded in the past. Islam kept expanding through violence and rape until it was actually stopped. So, right? So, so Muhammad teaches it and his followers expand. And then they expand across Northern Africa, up into Europe, in the West. And then they expand East and go all the way out to India and China and so on. But they eventually get stopped, right? They eventually get stopped. And now... What you have is, because Islam is so horribly scientifically backwards that technology basically expanded much more rapidly everywhere else in the world uh, than the Muslim world. And so everyone, I mean, uh, any, any Western nation or many Eastern nations are simply far, far, far more powerful than any armies that, that, that Islam is going to be able to put forward. So yes, the violent expansion just isn't going to work anymore. So what happens? You say high birth rates, question, question, question. You act like this is a dispute. Dude, the same article, the same Pew Research article that Muslims point to because it says Islam is the fastest growing religion, read it. Look up Pew Research, Islam fastest growing religion. The, the exact same article that Muslims point to to say, you see, we're the fastest growing religion. The exact same article explains why. And it gives the birth rates. In every area where there's most, in every area, whether you're talking about Africa, whether you're talking about uh, the Middle East, whether you're talking about Europe, every area you can point to, Muslims have the highest birth rates. That's why it's expanding. It, keep in mind, even in the West, Muslims have higher birth rates than non-Muslims. So this is not in dispute. Notice this is just facts. And you're making... <laughs> You make fun of the Bible when your book affirms the Bible. You make fun of facts that are put right in your face. This is nothing I'm saying is in dispute. Everything you're saying is wrong. So what? My goodness. Uh, high birth rates, you said, uh, it's growing in America. Your explanation wouldn't work. One, we know it's growing in America. I already, I already said this. It's growing in America primarily due to immigration and high birth rates, right? The, the, the number of people 
leaving Islam in America basically cancels out the number of people who are converting to it. Right? Is that what you is that what you believe in your delusional world that Islam is growing rapidly through through conversions? Because it's not. People are leaving Islam uh, about as fast as they're converting to Islam in America. So how is Islam growing at all? Immigration birth rates. So it, it, I'm I'm just going to be honest, man. It seems like every single fact that anyone could state, you are immediately resistant to it. I can't I can't I can't stand that. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear any basic facts, uh, any delusional nonsense that you've heard from your leaders and that that fits into your delusional state. Uh, you want to cling to that no matter what. So, with all that said, I'm glad you're here. I hope something eventually sinks in. And I agree with uh, with Colin. When you get a chance, when you're not all when you're not all <laughs> revved up because people are daring to state basic simple facts, uh, go back through, watch it, pay attention, and at some point, at some point, just just consider, just consider, maybe maybe my leaders have not all told me the truth, right? I mean, we're making very we're making claims that you can very easily look into, right? When your leaders told you. Perfect preservation, right down to the letter, from the time of Muhammad. And we say, no, there are all kinds of differences. And I say, hey, there are all kinds of entire chapters of the Quran coming up missing. And tons of textual uh, manuscripts and variants and so on. That's something you could look into. In other words, there's a prediction involved. If your leaders are telling you the truth, then you know that when you go to your sources and when you go to manuscripts, what they say is going to to uh, show itself, right? If what we're saying is correct, then when you go to the sources, when you go to the manuscripts, then you're going to find all this stuff. You're going to find out your leaders are liars. Why can't you do that? Do that. Do that. Then get back to us and tell us what you think. All right. Colin, back to you again. It's, it's interesting that that book I mentioned uh, before, kind of during the introduction about Jesus making appearances to people in the Muslim world. There's um, you talking about high birth rates and there's a story of a woman in there She's in like her late 20s, mother of eight, third wife, and her husband has set her aside because he found a younger model. Mm -hmm. And this is one you know woman that's been having, uh, having dreams of, of Jesus. But think about the high birth, birth rates. Again, she's like the mother of six, seven or eight, a lot of kids. She's the third wife, and her husband has another one. So that's something that's it's, it's real. I mean, we talk about, you know, high birth rates and the types of marriages that the Quran uh, permits. I mean, it's it's real and it has um, a real force in the world and impressing uh, oppressing women mm -hmm. and um, just really wreaking havoc on families. So it's it's a very serious thing. This proves that it's this true religion. Absolutely, absolutely. So we left off uh, <laughs> with. Uh, <laughs> I'm still on track. Uh, we left off with um, the the test that's applied to mystics. It's good to take a break because this is some of this is some pretty heavy stuff. Uh, the the test that's applied to mystics. One of the tests. Uh, you, you you get up to the the sixth palace and you see what looks like water. And if you say water, you're in trouble. You've been fooled. You're not worthy. You're out. We talked about how this shows up in the Quran in Surah 27:44. And the Queen of Sheba, though, she's the one who's fooled. And uh, so this tradition, of course, traced from the Hekelot literature, possibly influenced from the Talmud and into the Quran. Huge, huge problem here. Surah 27.12 begins, uh, I'm sorry, Surah 27.12 refers to signs. Okay, and, and this it's the context of uh, Moses and Pharaoh. Put your hand into the opening of your garment. It will come out white without disease. These are among the nine signs you will take to Pharaoh and his people. Indeed, they have been a people defiantly disobedient. Notice, these are among the signs. Verse 13 of Surah 27. But when there came to them our visible, these are visible signs, they said this is obvious magic. And this is the context in which these stories occur in the Quran. These stories are retold. Because they are signs to the people who are listening. Hey, this stuff happened. It happened. And it's proof of, you know, whatever, the power of Allah or his sovereignty or whatever it is. The surah continues. It goes down to talking about David and Solomon and then focuses exclusively on Solomon, talking about the birds and the jinn that were gathered for his armies. And the surah continues. And then we get to, of course, surah 2744, where we were before. 
<clears throat> these things for the Quran, including the Queen of Sheba and this palace with water that uh, – or what she thought was water, these are actual historical events for the author of the Quran. But they're not in actuality. They're products of mystical exegesis. And we've talked about the four who entered paradise and the water episode. Once again, hugely problematic when your book thinks that something is historical when it's actually not. It's a product of, of mystical exegesis, and we can actually see where that exegesis came from. Mm -hmm. Huge problem. Mm -hmm. So the um, early Muslims were at least more creative uh, when they were finding Muhammad in the Bible. And, um, you know, now it's just, look at Muhammad, Song of Solomon 517 or Isaiah 42 or whatever. He's there. He's there. At least, you know, in in some of the earlier literature, um, like Ibn Sa'd, we get um, some numerical patterns that are fairly interesting. And there were some Muslims who believed that the Islamic prophet would receive his calling at half the age of his predecessor. So they try to parallel Muhammad to Moses. So Moses was 80 when he stood before Pharaoh. How old was Muhammad when he got his calling? Oh, 40. What a coincidence. Muhammad died around 60, according to some accounts, because the birth dates of Muhammad vary greatly. The dates of his death, you protest too much, are 632 on the dot every single time. But some traditions put Muhammad dying at 60. Moses died at 120 years old, half the age. Once again, interesting. Uh, Muhammad, when you add up Medina and Mecca, equals about 20. Moses wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Okay, so once again, Muhammad's time periods in his life correspond to half those of Moses. Muslims today are much less creative and much more sloppy when they try to show that uh, Muhammad uh, is in the line of the Hebrew prophets. So, obviously, Deuteronomy 18 is a very common place, and, and David and many others, and rightly so, have pointed this out numerous times. So we'll just say, you know, verse 15, Deuteronomy 18, 15, I won't read it, it's very familiar, but uh, David and, and others have made the point many times, Muhammad doesn't fit there. Okay, mm -hmm. let's, let's go a little bit further. Um, let's see, uh, verse 18, oh, no, he doesn't fit there at all. Uh, verse 20, um, but the prophet uh, who presumes to speak a word in my name that I did not command him to speak, well, he does, definitely doesn't fit there. Uh, verse 21, if the word does not come to pass or come true, we talked about that previously in this live stream with the failed eschatological predictions of Muhammad. He, according to the Quran, did not know the future. This is something called the unseen. Only Allah knows the unseen. And so he's only given one prophecy, and that is the imminent judgment. And that failed. So he doesn't fit there either. But what this mystical background allows us to do is go backwards as well. So Deuteronomy 18, 9, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is, is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of the nations. And among them, verse 10, divination tells fortunes, interpret omens, sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer. It's like, all right, Moses, we get the point. When you look at how these things were practiced in the ancient world, there's a lot of overlap. Moses is making it clear. He's making a really long list. Sorcerer, charmer, medium, necromancer, one who inquires of the dead. Isn't that the same thing as a medium? You know, It's an exhaustive list. When you bundle these things up and say, what is common between these? The common factor is that Moses is telling these people on behalf of God through or because of God, he's saying, you do not use human mechanisms to access the supernatural world. You do not do it. And this is exactly what we see with Muhammad. He's appealing to human mechanisms, mystical mechanisms. He's cloaking himself. He's inducing these trance-like states. Once again, he's paralleled with Ibn Sayyid. He's using human mechanisms to try to access the supernatural realm. And that's exactly what Moses says you're not supposed to do this. That's dangerous stuff. And so when you understand this mystical background, it not only allows you to go from Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 4, but you can go back into all of those things that Moses prohibited and see that Muhammad was doing the exact same thing, the 7th century equivalent of these practices 
forbidden in the Torah. Pretty big problem. So he would have been under multiple death sentences from Moses. Well, and he also erected a sacred stone, yep. which Deuteronomy 16.22 says, the Lord your God hates that. So, yeah, there's there's another death sentence. So there's sentence. those, uh, the, the, the satanic verses, Muhammad delivering a revelation that he claims uh, was from God and then later came and said the devil tricked him. That was a death sentence. Muslims claim to respect Moses, and yet Moses would have put your prophet to death multiple times over. Muslims. It's a huge problem. And it's if you want to look at like a contradiction, I don't do contradiction videos. I haven't done one yet, but you know, what's a contradiction in Islamic theology? This would be one. Because on the one hand, you have this doctrine of the pure transcendence of Allah. On the other hand, you have a prophet who's using mystical means to access the supernatural realm, including Allah himself. If you want to take those two um, the, uh, theophanies in the Quran, sir, I believe it's 53 and 81, uh, which, has, as I alluded to earlier, has been a problem for some Muslim interpreters over the years for obvious reasons. But mm -hmm. it opens up a whole can of worms. It really does. And um, it's a big problem. It's surprised a lot of Muslims. I've seen, you know, email and, and so forth that Muhammad shouldn't have been doing this. Mm -hmm. No, he shouldn't have. He'd be in trouble. He'd be in trouble. So <laughs> it's against this background that when we look through the book of Revelation and um, Sahih al-Bukhari and we see the things that Muhammad did, you know, he, he cloaked himself and murmured to himself and went to trances, went to seclusion and so forth. Even other hadith that talk about trees talking to Muhammad, you know, the speech of palm groves and so forth. This is all, I believe, to be seen against the backdrop of Mirkava mysticism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, uh, we've been going uh, over two hours now, so um, I'm gonna take. Uh, I'm gonna read one more comment here from Abdul Rahman, and then we will. Uh, and then we will uh, uh, let um, let Colin close us out and give us any final thoughts or uh, summary. Um, but make sure, make sure you you uh, subscribe. So again, the link to Colin's channel, Islam Critiqued, is in. The description box and don't forget to wage jihad on that like button all right well here we go again <laughs> abdul rahman back on the same topic as earlier said right it wouldn't work current day we know it wouldn't work you you know obeying allah's command to go out and violently subjugate the world wouldn't work current day we know that people joining a religion to take spoils so why is it still spreading here in America? I feel like I've talked about this repeatedly, um, but I'll gladly repeat it <laughs> just because I think it's amusing. Um, so why is it still spreading here in America if that stuff doesn't work now? What's the reason for it growing this time? Abdul Rahman, we know exactly for the 50th time, we know exactly why Islam is growing in the West. Number one, immigration, right? Everyone in many Muslim countries wants to leave those countries because Islam has a has a massive knack, a miraculous knack, if you will, for making countries that people do not want to live in. People, where do where do people, where do people in Iran and Iraq and all these other countries want to go? They want to get out of those countries as fast as they can. Where do they want to go? They want to go to the land of the Kufar. Why is that? Why is that? Because they're just much, much, much better countries, apparently, right? So, immigration, number one. Two, even in Europe and America, Muslims have higher birth rates than non-Muslims. So that's number two. Number three, um, I've already pointed out, in America, the number of people uh, who are converting to Islam is already being balanced out by the number of people who are leaving Islam, and that's only going to increase. If you, if you go back to just, you know, when Nabil was getting started, it was rare to have a... a an ex-Muslim who's going around speaking about Islam. It was just it was just rare. Now they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're multiplying. It's picking up, it's picking up pace. It's snowballing. What do you think the situation is going to be like 10 years from now? Right? In other words, we've reached a point where the number of people converting to Islam is balanced out by the number of people who are leaving Islam. Do you think? What do you think is going to happen to that? The people the, the, the percentage of people who are Leaving Islam is going to increase, right? Until until you have more people leaving Islam than who are entering Islam. Um, so notice, that would just hold it equal. 
Um, you still do have people converting to Islam. If you're asking why that is, why do people convert to Islam? It's very simple. Uh, the, the, the preachers tell them lies, right? I have never met in my entire life a person who converted to Islam after doing anything I would consider a careful study of Islam. Not one. I've, I've met lots of converts to Islam. I've met a lot of them. Debates and things like that. And I talk to people in the audience afterwards. I've met lots of converts to Islam. When I ask them why they converted to Islam, I get lies. They, they believe them, but it, they were told lies, right? So your leaders, and, and by the way, if, if you want a, a fuller explanation of this, um, just watch my recent video, Islam's 99-1 rule. It will explain it very clearly in detail. You have your speakers like Zakir Naik and people like that. And when they speak, they know very few people are trained to go up and look up what they're saying. So when your preachers, when your Islamic preachers start go around telling people the Quran is filled with scientific miracles, the, the Quran is filled with verses that support and honor women, the Quran is filled with peaceful teachings that honor and respect Jesus. When you go around, you, you, when you go around saying these things, people just have a habit of believing you. They haven't caught on to the fact that these preachers are the biggest bunch of liars the world has ever seen. They haven't caught on to that yet. And so they believe them. And some people convert based on these lies. But by telling so many lies, we already said this, but by telling so many lies, by building Islam on such a foundation, a massive foundation of lies, they've made it easy. They've made it easy for people like us to go in there and wreak havoc on the entire system. And that's what we're going to do. And, and keep in mind, I mean, there's only a few of us. There's only a few of us doing this, but that number is growing. And if, if the few of us who are doing it right now, me, Colin, uh, Christian Prince, Sam Shimon, um, the guys like us, uh, if, we're, if we're able to wreak havoc, what do you think is going to happen when it's, it becomes you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000 people online wreaking havoc? On your religion, what are you gonna? You, you've, there's one apostate prophet channel now. What are you gonna do when there's 500 apostate prophet channels? You're you're in trouble, dude. Your your, your religion's in trouble. It's best to it's best to it's best to see the signs on the wall, see the writings on the wall. Actually, do some thinking for yourself. Realize you can't trust what these guys told you. Do some studying on your own, and once you start doing that, you're on your way out. Um, Shout out to uh, Patrick and shout out to uh, Josephine Mercy uh, for joining the Boom Squad. All right, Colin, we've been going, we've been going two hours and seventeen minutes right now. I'll let you close out. Any final thoughts? Any summations? Anything you want? Anything you want to tell people? I'm just getting warmed up. Two hours. And, <laughs> um, I think some of the most important work on my channel is source critical work because if you take the word of Allah and show that it actually comes from something else, some uh, rabbinic tradition or mm -hmm. something of that sort, then um, you've destroyed the Quran. And that applies to Shias and Sunnis and everyone. Um, for those who are interested, the next video I release tomorrow, it's actually ready to go now, um, but I'll probably release it tomorrow. Um, it's, it's on the story of Joseph, as I said earlier, and we do it again. We show where the story comes from, how the exegesis arose, and um, see that it made its way into the Quran. Once again, the Quran thinks it's historical material. It's really, it's really rough stuff, honestly. But um, it's it's important work. It's it's what I've been focusing on a lot lately. And if you are interested in that sort of thing, I'd certainly love to see you there and uh, see your comments and you know share the material as necessary. I get a lot of requests. Hey, can I upload your video? Do whatever you want with it. Okay, translate it if you want. You might make some mistakes, and by God's grace, those mistakes will improve the content. So it doesn't matter to me. Just share the content. Let's get the word out to Muslims. And um, be that voice that they're listening to when they're hiding in the bathroom or hiding in their bedroom, trying to get a little bit of Bible in their life. We can be a chorus of voices that they hear from across the ocean and even here in the West as well. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, again, one more time, if you haven't subscribed, be sure to subscribe to Islam Critiqued. Link is in the description box. And uh, if you if you if you watch these videos as they're coming out, um, th that's the that's the awesome thing about the time we're in. Uh, it, it's wide open, right? It's uh, 
Colin is on the cutting edge stuff. Islam has left all this stuff wide open for um, for looking, rooting around in their in, in Islam's cellar for all the dirty secrets about where Muhammad's getting these revelations. And Colin's going to find them all. He's going to bring them to the surface. And if you're subscribed, you're going to have access to those. And then you can go share those with your Muslim friends. All right. See you all next time. God bless everyone. And uh, Abdul Rahman. Do some studying, bro. Do some studying. Catch y'all. Praying for you. <laughs> catch y'all next time. Bye.